I've enlisted the help of Dr. Kieran O'Keefe. Hi, Kieran, I'm Danny. Hi, Danny. Hello. A parapsychologist who spent 15 years hunting the ghost hunters. So, Kieran, tonight we're going to be trying to prove these psychics are fake. Exactly. I'll be looking out for cold reading strategies, fishing. They'll be looking out for your reaction and anybody that's standing around them to try and see if they're getting confirmation of the information that they're coming up with. I've got Kieran to write me a fake history, which I've printed onto official-looking chocolate factory pamphlets. I've even hung a picture in the foyer of the factory's fictitious first manager, George Bull. So, so what you might get with one of the mediums is they might feel the pain in their legs. Of, of George losing his legs? Of George losing his legs. We know, though, that if our mediums come up with any of these names linked to the chocolate factory, they're talking a load of bull. Yeah, we want that and we want George Bull and we want the story associated that we've written for the chocolate factory. I so want George Bull. Yeah, I want George Bull too. George, don't fail us now, yes. wherever you are. Oh, well, yeah. Can, can you work out, like... My knee's gone. Your, your knee's gone. <laughs> yeah, right. Kieran, how on earth are we going to cover this place? It is absolutely enormous. There are so many different cells and so much paranormal activity. Where do we start? From a simple logistic point of view, there aren't enough people to cover the entire building all at the same time. What we are going to have to do is have, I guess, a parapsychological full-scale attack with all of the machinery, have the lock-offs, have trigger objects, have the MP3 recorders, have the thermal imager, try and have as much equipment down there as possible because it is such a huge place. In one place we might be focusing on experience, another place we'll be having the monitoring equipment. I want somebody to question what they see and what they experience. By the way, this isn't funny. You're actually meant to be serious at this point. What we're telling you is very serious and you have to listen to every single word the first step in you becoming the ultimate ghost hunter is seeing how susceptible you are to the paranormal. On the basis of just that task, do you think you're the ultimate ghost hunter? I think I've given it a fair crack. I didn't run out you straight screamed. away. You screamed. Screamed? You screamed very loudly. Lots of stuff happened and yet you didn't really investigate and you didn't last the distance. Okay. Why on earth? would I turn around and say, you're the ultimate ghost hunter? I have to say I'm quite impressed by Anne and Charlotte at the moment. Initially I was a bit dubious, but Anne is a very honest person and Charlotte seems to have more of a critical... And here, and here they are. Hello. The O'Keefe's. How's he going? Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. How are you? So, if you don't know, the one on the left, that's Kieran O'Keefe, and the one on the right is Anna O'Keefe. He's lovely, <laughs> beloved. Um, great to have you. Great to have you on the Ouija Brothers show. Uh, been a big fan of Kieran for a long time, you know, during the Mouse Haunted. Um, to have both you guys on, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, hopefully, Brilliant. hopefully it's a good one. Um, hopefully everyone enjoys it. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people happy to see you. Um, just as much as you know, yeah. to be honest, me and Griff, um, having you both you on. Um, yeah, I love it. It's probably my favourite show I've ever done. Every other one can just get lost, really. All yeah. the other shows. It's, uh, <laughs> gratitude, you know, ain't it? I'm only joking. But it's you know, I, I, have, yeah. I have looked forward to this one more than all the others, like I said earlier. Um, You're a star. Just, Thank just you. Because, um, just because, obviously, I respect everything that you do, to be honest. But that's it, really. But, well, yeah. you don't know everything I do, do you? <laughs> no, 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 no. That, that's what I mean. All the stuff There's behind stuff. those doors. Like, it's, 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 you know, it's a grey area, but... Um, well, publicly, yeah, I, I respect everything you do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I've got my respect to you guys as well. Look. Yeah, he's wearing it, guys. Some of the old, some of the only, that's exclusive merch, that is. That is exclusive. There's, there's only 50 of those shirts that exist, and I've still got 10 of them. So there's only 40 in his circulation. And I'm sure Kieran <laughs> owns three of them. <laughs> well, I think I do. I think I've got five. So, so yeah, that's it. it's good. <laughs> 
so yeah man um thanks for joining us we're going to do like you know we got a lot of questions and if we hey. depending how long this takes um you know there might be more questions at the end depending how quick we get through these you know the thing is we don't want to like run through them super fast you know just take your time answer them as as long and whatever is possible uh it's all good um but first of all you know i do want to talk about what you've recently you know what's kind of come out and that was the is it the battersea is that how it's pronounced the battersea yes. the battersea yeah. poltergeist um because i've been saying batters me but um, well, well from, from coronation that's, street but do you know do you know carl pilkinson and he says, yes. Mrs. Battersby. And he's like, Mrs. Battersby, Mrs. Battersby. He said, who the fuck is Mrs. Battersby? Well, you know, that, it just kills me. But that's why I was basing it on that. But it's Battersea. So Battersea, yeah. Carry, carry um, I mean, the, the thing is, I've heard a lot about it recently. You know, it's been posted everywhere. But I only actually watched it last night and this morning. I watched, well, I listened to all eight episodes and the bonus ones. Um, I listened to it all last night, um, last night and this morning. And it was amazing um very interesting very fascinating um if anyone hasn't seen it in the chat uh where can they find it kieran uh you can find it on bbc sounds um or bbc radio 4 podcasts yeah so if you just go to if you just go to bbc radio 4 on the internet and type in battersea poltergeist you'll find it or bbc sounds and type in battersea poltergeist you'll find it there so people can listen to it all over the world it's not just a uk thing yeah it's absolutely and also there's some little there's some little video bits as well some kind of promos and various things as there's a scene um that's filmed where i put the presenter into a vr environment and scare him to death so there's very various visual <laughs> bits as well as the podcast yeah it's absolutely amazing I, I i loved every second of it uh very fascinating very interesting so i do want to kind of talk a bit about that um there, there was a lot of points that you said in that which is it's you know it's so amazing and, and like true is you know when you talk about fear um playing yeah. an important an important role um and like when you was talking about things like that um it kind of i went back to an old something that i done quite you know this was quite a while ago and i was with this person and i've never met a man so petrified and scared the fear uh, overrun him it had got him so bad everything and anything was paranormal and i mean it, i mean things weren't even happening and he was saying oh my god that's paranormal oh my god did you hear that oh my god did you see this and i was like i said like, you you've crossed over to another level another level like the fear has took out of your body um so that was yeah, he weren't griff. Thank you, he weren't griff at all. It was, it was nuts. It was absolutely insane. But it was very interesting. So, so many amazing things happened during that. Um, what team did you come off? Did you come off on still fairly skeptical of everything that happened, Kieran? Or yeah, it's very tough because um, I went into it skeptical anyway, which I always do. But that just means that I'm open-minded and I'm questioning. Yeah. The issue with that particular case is that it went on for 12 years, but the first, even the first six months, the amount of stuff that happened rivals any other poltergeist case that there's ever been. You know, the amount of stuff was just amazing. The objects flying, the knocking, fires, objects disappearing. I mean, at some point, the whole family reported the slippers falling off a table and then walking by themselves along the floor. Wow. Now, that's not just an object falling. Yeah. That's a little bit more than that. So there's so much stuff. So I still come out of it on Team Skeptic side. But the issue is that to try and explain all of it, it's such a complex mix. And whereas it, it's, if anything, it's a lot easier just to say, you know what? It was a poltergeist. Yeah. That's just easier to do that. But the Team Skeptic <laughs> side have to come out and say it's psychology. It's a you know possibly you know um a little bit of pk or it's the environment infrasound it's emf who knows who knows what it is who knows yeah. what it is um we just had a donation again 27 dollars uh thank you again mr sao paulo brazil uh haha we know who this guy is you know all over the world kieran how does that feel even brazil that feels amazing absolutely amazing i still can't get over it i still can't get over it at all because i'm just a lowly academic yeah, I'll never Here forget that. I'll never forget the time that you know I ever first met you, 
uh, we they were good friends, you know, Paranormal Truth, Dale and Justin. Yes. Um, and we were we was at the Weatherspoons, and I was like, oh crap, Kieran O'Keefe's on his way, and I seen, I was like, oh my <laughs> god, here he's the man. Um, but you know, there was remember the 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 waitress, and she was yeah, that she was right. that terrified that she got her friend. Um, she, her, her friend come up and said, "Oh, um, my friend's over there. She's a big fan. You know, can you um, do an autograph? Sign a napkin or something." Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and and I yeah, jumped in. Over like this. I jumped in straight away. I was like, "Bring her over, man. Kieran will be cool. Get a picture. You know, get her over." Um, I, I, to be honest, I shouldn't have done that. But I remember when I was like such a big fan of you know going to concerts and like meeting like musicians and stuff backstage, and it always like meant a lot. Like actually meeting them. Instead of just, you know, buying, you know, like um, a signature or anything, that doesn't really mean as much. But like actually meeting the person and getting an autograph means a lot more. And yeah. and when that girl come up, you could see how much it meant. She, I've never seen anyone shake like that. She was in, like, I've never seen it. It was, it was amazing. Yeah. But again, it you know, it was amazing. It was you... amazing. And I still, and I still, I'm, I'm privileged to be in this position. I still find it amazing that people recognise me. You know, on in the street Asda. and stuff, and even in Asda, yeah, exactly. And there are other supermarkets, uh, <laughs> yeah. but they recognise me. And sometimes, well, a lot of the time, I have to think because you know people are looking at me, and they go, "Oh, I know you. Yeah, I know you. I know you from somewhere." And I always have to think, did I know them at school, or yeah. were they a neighbour or something? Because I still can't get over this fact that yeah, people recognise me from Most Haunted, even to the point where when Most Haunted was on. I was sat on a train from Manchester down to London and for the first 45 minutes of that train journey there was a lady sitting opposite me she could see I was reading a book about poltergeist as it happens she went oh that stuff is really interesting I said yeah yeah I'm fascinated by it she said oh, let me tell you about this show and for 45 minutes she described a show called most haunted just <laughs> down to the teeth everything oh and this my favorite episode about and there's this guy that's always kind of pooing the stuff and he just says it's rubbish <laughs> describe the whole thing and it wouldn't let me talk and then after 45 minutes she said and and what do you do and i said i'm dr kieran o'keefe off most haunted <laughs> <laughs> the color just went from her face it's yeah, brilliant no it's absolutely just brilliant telling you but, how bad you are at telling but you crap everything. when anna and i met she had no idea who i was really did you you had no idea no Oh, I feel, I feel like what my brother was like into Most Taunted, I think, a little bit more than I was. Well, I only watched like a couple of shows and I didn't, obviously, he wasn't in any of them. And um, yeah, they just, as I said, they just gave me an option of like two two men I could have had at this event. Well, it was a ghost hunt, wasn't it? Yeah, it was it? a ghost Down hunt at... event, a wearing manor. And um, yeah, it was Colin, is it Colin Shepherd? No. No, no Brian Shepherd. Brian Shepherd. See, I don't even know. So there was a choice of oh, two God. people, <laughs> choice of two people that Anna could have had at yeah. this ghost hunt. Brian Shepherd or me? What do you Karen mean by how did these this this yeah, this sounds, this sounds, sounds like a weird, you know, you know <laughs> a dodgy girl? This could turn into something else. Yeah, and she didn't know me, but thought, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a ghost hunt. So uh, it was a ghost hunt for charity. Yeah, it? So I used to charity. work for charity, and they used to organise ghost hunts to raise money. And they okay. were big fundraisers for us. So I sold out this event at Wimmering Manor with a famous medium there. And the medium didn't turn up at last minute. Um, so we had to get a stand in. And the person that was helping to organize the event from the um, ghost tank company gave me a choice of two people. So, yeah, one of them was the medium. And then the other one was this Kieran O'Keefe. And I thought, well, I like the sound of his name. I didn't know didn't know who he was, but I thought I'll have him. <laughs> See his eyebrows there. He's like... <laughs> <laughs> The whole history of the last, of the last what, what, 10, 11 years, the whole history would be totally different if she'd gone to Brian Shepherd. Yeah. Wouldn't it? We never would have met. And we actually met and at Wimmering Manor because faster. you liked the name. I remember That's true. the person that was there said that, you know, Kieran can get here in like under two hours, wasn't it? Or yeah, something. Yeah, and I was like, just, right, just get him, just get him here. I need brilliant. him here now. It's great. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. The rest is history. So, so yeah. yeah, um in the chat we got Mr. Justin Kell. Uh how's it going, Justin? Oh, Justin Kell. Good Hi, Justin. to have you in. Um so yeah, I think what I think it's time to crack on with some questions because like I say we we could talk for hours without even doing a question. So we will get into them. You know, we're gonna do questions for both uh, you know, for Kieran, Anna, and I obviously we want answers from both of them as well. You know, there's a few questions there for the bathroom to do so yeah we're going to get straight on to it so the first question i'll am i starting with the questions jace and then you're going to do 
Are we running them down the list, or are we just mix and matching, and then I have to remember? Mix which and match. We did, no, no, we'll, just, we'll, no, we do it in order. So we go from question one. I mean, I think it'd be more exciting if we just just pick one. And no, then, but no, yeah, we have not... to guess if we did that one earlier. No, no, that's that's a that's a, a, that's a bad more. idea. That's <laughs> that's not organised at all. You know what I'm like with my LCD. No, I know, I know. Anyway, I know that's why I'm winding you up. I know. Anyway, so, so we're going from one. We're going to question number one. Okay, question number one. So what I'm going to do? I'm going to flick the screen. Uh, so we're going to make it look a bit more posh. So anyway, question number one uh, for Mr. Oh, Kieran. Yeah. Uh, why did you become a parapsychologist, and who or what influenced your decision? Oh, lovely question. Uh, Ghostbusters. Simple as that. I was 13 years old. I'd been fascinated by ghost stories anyway. Uh, Clive Barker, H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, Stephen King, uh, M.R. James. I'd read those as a kind of an early, uh, as a boy, basically. My parents were worried about what I was doing in terms of reading these ghost stories and these weird macabre short stories. So I was fascinated by the idea of ghosts. But then when I was 13, the movie Ghostbusters came out and I saw that and I thought, you know what, that's what I want to do. I want to be a parapsychologist like these guys. I want to put on the proton pack and I want to go out and ghost bust. Um, and so, yeah, basically the rest is history, even to the point where when I saw the film, I called up Columbia University and asked them about their parapsychology unit at Columbia University. And there was a bit of swearing at the end of the phone the lady that answered the phone but a quarter on a good day and she said well all right if you're interested in this stuff then you want to get in touch with the institute of parapsychology in north carolina attached to duke university um and ask them about it and i did and they gave some recommendations as to what i should do in terms of getting psychology qualification and various things i ended up doing investigations but that was the key turning point I mean, at the time as well, there was a show called um, Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious World, which I was fascinated by. But um, the key turning point was the film Ghostbusters, 100%. Amazing. Um, and, and a good it film is, as well. A, a, good, a good film to pick, you know. Uh... I could have chosen Mary Poppins. It would have been a totally different career. <laughs> we wouldn't but, be yeah. talking to you right now, so you'd be looking after children somewhere else so, <laughs> you'd be doing something different so i'll tell you that now <laughs> go on then griff question oh, number this two one's, uh, this one's run out are you a skeptic or a believer because yeah. 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 I, I i presume it's hard I'm nervous saying that around him <laughs> So, so you because obviously the, i think the sound cut down a little bit then could you just could you say that again what did you say oh i, I said i'm a believer yeah that's it then all believer so beads of beads of sweat i yes. can say a little bit just sitting next to kim <laughs> well, <laughs> well that'd be good so why are you a believer why a believer um well we've just got yeah we always have we had to have these healthy arguments don't we but i mean from a very early age um i used to live in a 300 year old house when i was growing up and it was just like a given that we used to see my brother and sister and i used to see stuff around the house and feel stuff around the house and um it was known as it's, it's known locally as a haunted house and so we just grew up having these experiences um so it was just a, an automatic yeah just like a new things were around and used to be scared by it when i was little and then, yeah, when I was growing up, I had like different experiences, which uh, you poo pooed, and some of them you thought, like, actually, no, that's quite a good experience. And yeah, so we've always, so yeah, I was a believer basically before I met him. So, <laughs> so what are you now? Like, are you, are you a mixture of like. Um, no, I, I'm a believer, definitely, because there's still stuff that I experience, which, you know, we could start arguing about it. <laughs> but yeah, I still experience stuff that, you know, you can't explain. So yeah, no, I'm still a believer. Me and Steve can switch our cameras off and you two can talk about that for about an hour if you want. It's, uh... <laughs> I'm sure everyone would love to see that. <laughs> a live argument about the paranormal. Yeah. Yeah. It does make for an interesting yeah. household. It, it does. really does. It really does. And, and yeah, I guess the point is we haven't really changed in terms no. of our beliefs. <laughs> like you said, Anna's very good. She, she picks up on micro expressions. Yeah. Thank you. When I first met him, if I told him a story, he'd just do this slight smirk out of the little corner of his mouth. And he could just tell he didn't believe me. Yeah. He only, yeah, he's, yeah you don't. <laughs> but yeah, now it's sort of dropped. So you do. I think yeah, he does believe me. Have you ever had like Maybe. an argument in the house where, like, say, like something's moved, 
and then it's like I swear someone's moved that and Kira's there going, no, you've just obviously forgot where you placed it the first time. And then you like, no, yeah. no, no, something's moved. There's something that's literally moved. Has that ever happened? Or... Not with me. Sound. Oh, yeah. 100% sound. Yeah. And movement yeah. as well. There's like, Kieran keeps saying that there are squirrels living in our <laughs> floor. Between, in our children's bedroom, there's 100% something, I think, something you can hear it get off. It, like jump down and walk across it's like a sound of a light child we all know what children sound like yeah and every, during the day i hear it at night we hear it and you are <laughs> so, squirrels. It's those squirrels again it's the squirrels or the rats in the roof space it's like no kieran we well, want to get that sorcy put some traps down or get a, a pest or so then, <laughs> yeah, and then, and and then you can't argue down. about it then because then it's like if it does happen again you're like well there's no squirrels yeah that's true but then I'm worried if I put traps down, I'm going to catch some children. That would be <laughs> <laughs> pretty small children. But... <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. So, so, so for Kieran, um, from a parapsychologist's perspective, what is a ghost? Uh, that's a really good question because you could take a number of different views. So within parapsychology, all you're recognizing is that people are having anomalous experiences that can't necessarily be explained otherwise. And the significance of a ghost is that it's some sort of contact or after death communication. So it's some sort of contact with the afterlife. The issue is that parapsychologists will argue about what actually a ghost is even if it's some sort of after death communication it's a you know spirit showing themselves is it actually kind of if if you see an apparition is it somebody appearing or coming from the afterlife to appear is it a form of clairvoyance where that person is showing themselves in your mind and you think it's externally happening but they're showing themselves in your, in your mind. So is it something like that, a form of telepathy, which has been researched within parapsychology, I would say, for at least 100 years as one particular theory. So if you're talking about the paranormal, parapsychology says it's either the appearance of a spirit, so the actual appearance, or it's this form of telepathy, almost almost as though it's it's a hallucination, but hallucination makes it sound like it's kind of a normal explanation and that's not what we're talking about it's a, a projection into your mind mm. yeah, and which ties in with a lot of you know some mediums work that that way where they see things clairvoyantly well why why couldn't that be happening to normal members of the public so that's kind of how parapsychology sees ghosts um, yeah, because like yeah. it's like what you're trying to say is every personal experience you've ever had can be debunked by that that kind of way of thinking well, yeah, because I'm just talking about the visual side, but parapsychologists recognise, as we all do, a ghostly experience doesn't just have to be the visual. It can be sound. Yeah. It could be that you could be touched by a ghost. You could smell a ghost. You could have that sense of presence. Well, well one theory is all of that could be something visiting from the afterlife, 100%. The other theory is all of that could be the the that afterlife person projecting these experiences into you giving yeah. you the sense okay. or the feeling that something is there when actually it's not it's just a projection yeah and okay. i guess i guess what parapsychology is trying to do in terms of in terms of giving theories is saying the jury's out on all of this you know the even parapsychology recognizes people have ghostly experiences we cannot deny that People have them, but the debate is what actually are they? You know, yeah. and there's a whole series of paranormal explanations as well as normal explanations. So yeah. That's why you could we could talk about it forever. Forever. <laughs> forever. Forever. Until something I don't know. Until Anna falls asleep. And, like, <laughs> no, not us personally, but I mean in general, like oh, yeah. until a point of where we actually get the answer. Yeah, I think we could. Do you think we'd ever get the answer? Well, because how how can you prove it? Yeah. How can you prove any of that? You know, the only proof would come, well, real proof would come, when you die. Really, to be honest, you know, it's it's personal proof, isn't it? Yeah. 
you know it's from a, from a scientist perspective all we can do is kind of discount the normal explanations for what's happening and that leaves the paranormal explanations but again the paranormal explanations could be so many so the jury's still out and i think the jury will forever be out i don't think we'll prove it but i think we'll get closer to understanding what it is not rather okay. than what it is if that makes any sense yeah, yeah. i think it's all about it's all about personal experience and if anything anna and i were talking about being a skeptic and a believer which we are we still have that that difference but i think maybe if anything being with anna has made me more i don't know sympathetic or empathic no <laughs> yeah kind of how good just imagine yeah, you standing there people no, take where am i going and you're this? like oh yeah oh, <laughs> oh lovely story <laughs> look how cute you are oh. that story that you've just no. Uh, no i think it's it's knowing anna <laughs> and hearing particular experiences that she's had and there's been a couple of experiences yeah. that i sit there and i i see and feel the genuineness of the story and feel the fear as she's retelling the story and the nature of the story and some of those things that she's talking about i just go well i can't really explain that you know there's the you can't really apply normal explanations to that yeah. there's a lot more going on there and i think that's if anything having that constant contact and talking about this stuff debating it yeah, investigating constantly. places together yeah. that sort of thing trusting you all of this all of this whole combination <laughs> this, you know it's all right <laughs> all of that all of that has 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 kind of yeah made made me more empathic more understanding of people's experiences mm. yeah. if anything whereas 15 20 years ago i might have been a little bit more yeah, cynical yeah, we have so yeah so everybody has Anna to thank for that. <laughs> oh, I think it's just for, it's good to hear, to be honest, that the fact that like obviously you've grown, like she's seen that you've grown, like you said, more empathic towards people with their experiences and stuff like that. Even though, probably deep down, you think to yourself, "Ah," oh, or, or <laughs> something like that. It's a, that to that expression. Um, with the head tilt. Oh, isn't yeah, that sweet? Like, <laughs> oh. You know, I mean, I'm, I've probably been a victim of that uh, that head turn when we was at Ace Drive, when we was telling you some of the stuff that happened to us. But um, again, like I, what I was going to say was, is like it's like you was you were saying was personal experience, and the personal experience is key for that person. So you, like, even though it was their personal experience, when they come to you and tell you the story, and it's like you said you were speaking to Anna, and she, you could feel that emotion that she has towards that experience, which makes it even more real because if we we can we can even um go onto the onto the like the next bit of like saying like believing in god or religion and stuff like that because it's real to that one person makes it completely real to them whether you believe it or not so yeah, but also, and then you, and then you yeah. feel that so but also it's the it's the arrogance of some scientists to try and explain it away yeah but they weren't there yeah do you know what I mean? So it so is. So you very need to be there as well. Like it's, well, it need, it, you need to be there. But even if you're there and somebody has the experience, who am I to, you know, go in all guns blazing and say no, it's rubbish because of this? Yeah. You know, there's particular times I can do that if if people are saying, well, what do you think mm -hmm. happened, and kind of you know, what do you think is going on? But I think generally, people's subjective personal experiences, when especially when they're significant, they're their own. Yeah. You know, there's nothing I can do to, to explain it away and unless people ask for an explanation. But even then, there's an element of responsibility of kind of respecting the fact that it's their experience. I can't take anything away from that. And I suppose that's the same with because um, because obviously it's the same with video evidence and stuff like that. You have to be there because we can all explain video evidence when we're watching it from afar. But if you're, because if you're not there, then you can just turn around and say, well, that could have been this, 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 or that. But if you're there to investigate, and this is the whole point of doing ghost investigations, the whole, this is the whole point of being, becoming a ghostbuster, is to be there and experience all of this and investigate and have a, a better understanding. And it's like, it's not what more you know, it's what you don't know in the yeah. sense and what you've got to figure out while you're there more so. so. Absolutely. I think video and photography stuff is, is a different sort of debate. I think you're absolutely yeah. right that, you know, 
you could talk throughout the night in terms of trying to convince somebody with a video evidence or photographic evidence. They constantly maybe come back with all the scenarios and going, oh, you might have done this or you might have done that or blah, 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 blah. Yeah, the yeah, same yeah. sort of conversation. I think the difference with that sort of evidence is there are some circumstances where you can start to analyze it and you can maybe look for natural explanations, but only yeah. in some circumstances. In others, you can't. But with people's personal experience, again, and you know, unless they're after an explanation and then you can go through various forms of questioning and yeah. kind of get a sense of what's going on. But even then, the frustrating thing, which is also the thing that draws all of us to it, is it's fleeting, it's spontaneous, it's happened, it's gone, it's yeah. in the past. So we can't go back and measure the environment and measure everything yeah. to know exactly what happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, just, yeah, it's, just, it's just good. I mean, like I said, we could talk about that all day. Um, the next question, I mean, we are going to talk about it all day, but it's just around out. Were you interested in the paranormal before you met Kieran? Like, this is for you. Uh, was you interested in it? Like, was it something that you was like you wanted like to find more about before you met? Because obviously, you mentioned that you did like a uh, um, charity event. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, I wasn't. Um... Well, because, um, other than my background in terms of seeing stuff as a young child and growing up in this house that was uh, active, um, I, yeah, I didn't have any, I knew of Most Haunted, I, I hadn't probably watched, I think it was two episodes or something roughly, um, like halfway through, didn't have any interest in the paranormal other than, yeah, it was my job, so I used to do about, um, i say about 15 ghost hunts a year doing the charity work and that's, you know, I just became interested in it because of the charity job I had. So yeah, I wasn't I wasn't into paranormal in you know the way that I'm into it now, I guess. No. I well, guess you were. Right? <laughs> well, no, 15, 15 ghost fifteen ghost hunts a 15 year. Fifteen to twenty, wasn't that? Yeah, fifteen to twenty. Yeah, ghost yeah. hunts for charity. We had to be into it. But yeah, I mean, I I loved it. I absolutely loved ghost hunting. Miss it terribly because I had you know used to have an amazing time. I used to I loved scaring myself. Um. So yeah, I do miss it. <laughs> so, I'm just laughing at some of the some of the stories you told about oh, yeah. being scared. Hellfire Caves is a particular yeah, yeah. classic one. There's I a few. Yeah. yeah, professionalism goes out the window when I'm terrified. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, it does. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I've been scared quite a few times. Uh, I mean, I've seen on on uh, on Kieran's, you know, to to find the, the paranormal investigator or whatever he was, and um, and you weren't happy. Because one of the people like, got up and he screamed and he went running out and he was like, you screamed, you ran out. You think that makes a good investigator? And I was thinking sometimes you can't help. You know, when something's kicking oh, yeah. off, you're gone. You're, 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 you're run, running for your life. It's going Absolutely. back to, to try and debunk it uh, and then try and find out reasons of what what caused that, what happened. Um, I don't know where Griff's gone. Gr Griff's vanished. I don't know if he's been cut. But anyway, oh, is, he, oh, is, is that where he's gone? I don't know. I've just, I've, yeah. Sorry, oh, he's back. I was in the, la he's I was in the ladies' room. He's back. Anyway, um, we, we've got a few people in the chat. We've got Moxley. How's he going, Moxley? We've just got World Mr. Grey. Um, paranormal Truth is in the Par chat, no, Stephen. I've seen Paranormal, pa pa yeah. seen paranormal that Truth. That was a while ago. Um, how's he going, Dale and Justin? Good to see you in here. For, um, first time in a long time. Um, so, yeah, mm. and this is a question for both of you guys now. Uh, okay. Do you think Hollywood portrays the paranormal in the best possible light? What are your top three paranormal movies of all time? So, kind of two questions. Uh, that's a really good question, because we're talking about Hollywood, and Hollywood, you could talk about films. Let's talk about movies. Do they portray it in the best light? You know what? Yes. So what? I, I, you know, I don't know if everybody will agree with me, but movies are entertainment. So absolutely, they portray it in a way that entertains. And I love ghost movies. I love horror movies. So they do it in that way. I think if we're maybe stretching that definition of what Hollywood is and maybe talking a little bit more about ghost, ghost movies that specifically are focused on the investigation side of things, you know, kind of movies that reflect that sort of investigation. So let me think of some recent ones classic ones conjuring and conjuring 2 those are hollywood based movies james wan great director but effectively he was taking real life stories trying to portray it as an investigation and it was made entertainment so from that perspective i guess what they're doing is yeah they're not giving the true story for us that for those that know the enfield 
Poltergeist, which is Conjuring 2, you'll know the real story. For those that don't know the real story, and they watch the Conjuring 2, and they think that's an accurate representation of what happened, that's maybe where it's doing a disservice. You know, but, but then again, is it doing a disservice? Because I don't think it's portrayed in any other way other than its entertainment. But I guess the, the, the issue is the beginning of the film where it says this is based on true events or based mm. on a true story. People see that yeah. and they go, wow, The Conjuring 2. And wow, could you Ed, and Lorra- Ed, <laughs> yeah, Ed and Lorraine Warren, they investigated the Enfield poltergeist. Wow, there was a nun there. There's all of this stuff. And people watch that and go, wow, that's amazing. Really, did all of that happen? And I guess that's the disservice if you're not thinking in your head, actually it is entertainment. It's stretching the boundary of, of what's real. So yeah. that would be my take on, on what Hollywood are doing. The second part of the question is, is the top three. You, you don't like ghosts. I can't three. watch. Is... I can't watch any. I can't watch any. <laughs> really? You can't watch any? Can't. How are you on an investigation? I know, I just can't, because I just scare myself. I just, I, it's because I have such vivid dreams at night. I mean, I have amazing dreams. And I just, if I watch anything at night, I just, that's it. I won't be able to see. I have to watch, if I watch something scary, I then have to watch a happy, fluffy film afterwards, straight after, or something. I can't. But you got your hands so, yeah. full there, uh, Kieran. <laughs> I know. So he has to watch horror films on his own. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Well, we organise it. So Anna's doing something else whilst I'm watching a, a, yeah, a ghost film or horror film. My top three, though. <gasps> my top three scary films is that what we're it going was, for it was, it was top films? three uh paranormal movies so i think that yeah that, that it can be anything you know like the exorcist anything like supernatural like i that. was gonna say i'm gonna have a, a top three but not in any order yeah that's all right because they kind of change the order and you mentioned one but actually it's the exorcist three Oh yeah, that's that's in my top three. Love, absolutely love that film. It it, it took a, a, it it took a totally different take to the first. It was it was more it was a more like a detective film, weren't it? It uh, was a detective film, but also the, what I loved about it was that it it played with the idea of demonic possession and it almost jumping to different yeah people, and there was that part of it as well, and kind of the traveling astral projection type thing, and who was possessed, who wasn't. There's a serial killer involved. I mean, it was just, yeah, it was kind of a, a, a mix of things, but I just loved it. It was a real lovely approach with George C. Scott and others. So The Exorcist 3, definitely. I mean, it, I it, would... it, it, it's also the, the probably the only good uh, sequel to The Exorcist because the other sequels are, are, are pretty out there, you know, putting it nicely. But the third yeah. one, I do like the third. You know, I've got it on Blu-ray myself. Um, it was the one I remember from when I was a kid as well. Uh, it was the only one really worth watching, which is actually quite weird for, from a kid's perspective because it is a slow movie, isn't it? It's not like balls to the wall full of action. It's a slow pace film. Um, I appreciate it a lot more now as an adult as well, boy. Yeah, that was a good one. The Exorcist 3, definitely. But also, but also for me, um, what I loved about it was that um, I lived for four years in the States. Um, I went to university at a place called Washington College. And for a significant amount of that time that I was there, I was based at Georgetown University, um, and most of the scenes that you see in The Exorcist 3 are all around the Georgetown University campus. So kind of it, it makes makes me more immersed in the movie, if that makes any sense. Definitely. So yeah, so The Exorcist 3. The other one actually has, has come into my top three last year, and that's Host, the movie Host, which is um, only came out last year, um, and it's an hour long, and... It's basically a seance done on Zoom. That's okay. all it is. Oh, I've, I've seen I've seen the trailer to that. That looked pretty I've seen the trailer, pretty yeah, decent yeah. actually. Yeah, it is okay. brilliant. And and if I recommend if people haven't seen it, do catch it. Um, it I think it's available on Shudder, Shudder channel, but you can watch it in other formats as well. But watch it like this: if you're on a laptop, switch all the lights off, and watch it on the laptop like you're in the Zoom call. Yeah. Because the screen is just like the screen we've got now in terms of it's actually on Zoom, okay. written by uh, Jed Shepard and Gemma Hurley. And yeah, it's just brilliant. It's just an hour long and it's just a, a roller coaster ride of a, of a sound. So that would be my other one. My third one. Oh, dear. Oh, God, that's so many. <laughs> How 
with the horror films, if you said horror films, I'd go Hellraiser. Oh, in my top three. But it's film. not really paranormal. No. It's a horror film. Um, maybe a little Spanish film called The Devil's Backbone. Okay. Which came out, which came out the same time as The Sixth Sense, which is also a great... Uh, is it Sixth Sense? The Others. Yeah, do you remember the Nicole Kidman yeah, yeah, film? Yeah, yeah, so the others came out, and that was absolutely huge. And people yeah, were talking yeah. about it and saying, don't spoil the ending, and blah, blah, blah. That came out. At the same time the others came out, there was a film called The Devil's Backbone, which was directed by a little-known director at the time, Guillermo del Toro, who's now gone on to you know big and greater things. But it's a little story um, kind of about an orphanage in the middle of nowhere, and there's a ghostly boy that haunts that orphanage. And that is creepy. Forget yeah. the others. The others is like Disneyland compared to <laughs> Devil's Backbone. So yeah, do check that out. Yeah, the concept of the others was fun. I mean, yeah, me, me and Griff, like we went to the cinemas to watch that together, didn't we? The others when that first came out. Oh yeah, yeah. I remember that. That, that was yeah, amazing. Was um, was younger. Did you, you get know? one bucket of popcorn or two? <laughs> <laughs> I think we get. Well, I think there's. A, I don't there's think a I could have even afford it then. No, we could. There was a male Dale for we can afford it, man. We we got it. We it's got it. kids. We were, we were, as children, as as eleven year old boys, we <laughs> thought now we got this massive popcorn, massive cow cage. You know, it was just, we had everything. I was oh, I just I've just th I've just thought of my other my other one that should have been in the top three is uh, Poltergeist, of course. Oh yeah. What well, the because remake the or the original? No, the original. Yeah. Because of the yeah. because of the investigators in it. I mean, the whole story is brilliant, and it's, yeah. you know, it goes a bit crazy at times. But yeah, the investigators. At so, times. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> it says at times. <laughs> the whole film, All the way through. It's, it's madness. But no, I was going to ask you before, because you were going on to the next question. Sir. No, I was going to just go through my favourite um, um, oh, okay. paranormal film. I was just going to do that as well. Um, oh. so, so for mine, even though you know, I'm questioning myself, but it doesn't matter. Um... I've I've got to put The Exorcist in there, you know. It's one of the, the all-time greatest um, horror films of all time, in my opinion. I know a lot of people say, "Oh, it's cheesy, it's garbage." You know, I don't I don't think so. I think it's one of the best all day. Um, also based on like a true story, you know, based on it's it's just it's got everything incredible. Another one um, is The Entity. That was one of the only oh, yes. films that scared the hell out of me as a kid. Um, and again, that's based on a true story as well. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's just terrifying. And she never got rid of that entity. Apparently, it stuck with her until the day she died. Um, yeah. So very, very Defeo, fascinating. I think it's the DeFeo story. Yes, in California. That's right. Yeah, the entity. Brilliant film. Yeah. Really so, and for another one, I'm going to have to just do another two quickly. I really enjoyed... Um, the Exorcism of Emily Rose. I, I thought that was a, a great movie as well. Yeah, I yes. was going to say that. One. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and then another one. I mean, I, it, it is it is supernatural. It is kind of paranormal, but it's more of a black comedy. I love Beetlejuice as well. <laughs> brilliant film. <laughs> he just wanted to get one of his favorite films. No, it's a good. It's a, it's a good film. It is a good film. But if if you it think Beetlejuice film. is kind of like like the others is like a modern take on Beetlejuice in a way. You know, it's kind yes. of like the, the same kind of concept. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they're living there at the same time, aren't they? There's yeah, and they the, don't know the them dead. Between. Yeah. Absolutely. The oh. Exorcism of Emily Rose, though, that's a brilliant film. That's an American kind of transference of the Annalise Michelle case over yeah. to America. And the guy that directed The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Scott Derrickson, he then went on a little bit later and directed a film, Deliver Us from Evil, which okay. is also a great film, which is about... Oh, yeah. oh, which is about possession, but it's about um, a guy called Ralph Sarchi, who was a New York police detective, and he turned up at a case. There was a you know domestic disturbance. He turned up at the house, and it ended up being this full-blown demonic possession. And he was just freaking out as a police sergeant, thinking, "What? What is going on here? This is just madness." <laughs> a priest turned up, did an exorcism, and from that point for from that point forward, Ralph was paired up with this exorcist. And they would investigate cases of demonic possession around New York, and that's a, it's a true story basically. And Deliver Us from Evil is, is kind of a film of his story. So yeah, it's brilliant. brilliant yeah, stuff. I'll check that out. I, I was going to ask you because obviously we're all there talking about films and that. But you know, um, what do you tell? Because obviously, Paranormal Activity is the I believe to be one of the because if you want like like Paranormal Activity. 
it's like the biggest one for that if you know what i mean so it's like with no human interaction um like it just happens on its own now i understand that at the end of the films they go a little bit crazy and like it, it, that's when you turn it off but the the actual films themselves the build up where for the paranormal activity like with the doors opening the drawers opening the bangs and stuff like that i think that that makes like one of my favorite films for the paranormal because that is everything i want to happen to me yeah. oh the paranormal like, activity movies you yeah, the, but do you know not all of the paranormal activity but maybe the first, start getting first, stupid, the first first two few, the yeah. first few and and it starts getting ridiculous after that but it's like that that activity in those films is um obviously a ghost investigator's dream yeah absolutely you know, and the way they set up they set up lock off cameras as well yeah and they capture footage on lock off cameras you can kind of relate to that as a ghost yeah. investigator can't and you? that's why i think it's the best paranormal film genre because it's solely paranormal in the sense of it's not mixture of poltergeist activity with a possession or a conversation of a, a confiscation of a child well, i don't know she goes she, she goes pretty possessed near the end don't no, she? But, but, but she's stupid she needs to leave the film she she's not she's not welcoming what i'm trying to talk about right now she like literally i'm just on about the activity of the house within yeah. itself is like that's that's basically why i love those, those yep shows. i think yeah prefer, well argued absolutely mm. yeah brilliant next question jace oh is it me again it's you all right so which one let me have a look uh, number six so was Kieran. Uh, Stephen, just, sorry man just give me just I, you've I got just it need a, i need a second just a second um <laughs> Kieran, what are your thoughts on uh, psychic detectives involved in cold case investigations? Uh, that's a two-part question, because the first part, what do I think of psychic detectives? I think they should leave criminal investigations well alone, 100%. Yep. And, and I'm saying that without commenting on whether or not they have an ability or not. I, I, I think it has nothing to do with the actual ability and the proof of a psychic ability or not. It has nothing to do with that. It's just the fact that the involvement of psychic detectives can lead an investigation off on a tangent that then becomes a waste of money, manpower, kind of takes the focus away from the actual case. So, you know, even if there is a genuine ability to psychic detectives, and I've done research on this in my master's, I don't think that they should play a role. And, and Madeleine McCann is a perfect example within about a month of Madeleine McCann going missing, there were over 3,000 leads provided by apparent psychic detectives. Now, the amount of money and manpower and kind of, you know, misdirection that would have had to have gone into place to follow up every single one of their leads would detract from the actual investigation. Yeah. And especially when my experience dealing with a lot of psychic detectives and some of the ones where they've got some of the best testimonials, at least in the UK this is, is that they will say and be honest about it that they are not right they're not a hundred percent right a hundred percent of the time yeah. yeah so they recognize that they're not a hundred percent right a hundred percent of the time and yet when i ask them and say well can you recognize those moments where you are not right as in do you get a feeling and they go no i don't know which ones they are but certainly i wouldn't be right 100 percent of the time well if that's the case don't get involved in criminal investigations where it's about finding a missing person or it's about solving a murder because it's just distracting. But do you second, think but the second, <coughs> sorry, the second part of that question was about the cold case though. Yeah. Should they get involved in cold case work? That's a different question. And if anything, psychic detectives, what they could lend to cold case investigation is, is out of the box thinking. You know, by, by being a psychic detective and getting involved, what my experience in terms of interviewing these psychic detectives is some of the times the way that they see the, the, the criminal case going and the way that they see the suspect or the murderer involved in it is so left field. It's just not kind of the normal path that an investigation would take that that can actually be useful in a cold case because all other avenues have been exhausted. So potentially there could be a role for psychic detectives simply because they're thinking very, very differently. Yeah. You know. I was, I was going to say, do you think that that's, um, 
you think the detectives and like obviously the authorities should um should just not bother with them at all because it's their choice isn't it to involve them so it's like they take advantage of that don't they so it's it's not so much you can't place all the blame on the the people that go out there saying i can do this and do that and do this and it's like they ask for that also don't they the the um well it's it's, yeah but you're also talking about a difference between the uk and north america potentially or in the uk you know there are clear directives from what used to be the association of chief police officers or from the met police or scotland yard wherever but there's clear directives not to use them yeah and and in the uk they're not yeah. But the issue is that if a psychic detective comes to a police station and says, oh, that murder case or that missing person case, I've got some information that's psychically no, obtained. Yeah. Here you go. There's an obligation for the police to take that information down because they don't actually know where the information comes from. Oh, the person yeah. might be saying it's psychically obtained, but they might have some genuine information that yeah. they're trying to disguise that it's obtained psychically so there's an issue there but also if a family in a missing person case if they are requesting help from a psychic detective there is nothing that the police can do about that so okay. you know so their involvement that way which is very different from the model in north america where you do get police officers independently going and consulting psychic detectives and i don't want to make it sound like it happens all the time it doesn't Mm. got police officers with a particular belief in this sort of stuff um the noreen rainier case for example in williston there was a williston um resident who was a a a, went missing within 48 hours one of the police officers knew of noreen rainier who was a psychic detective and so he went to go and speak to her about it and there's different sort of regulation in north america and different sort of thing a yeah. way of approaching it so so maybe they should just become detectives and work for the police anyway yeah exactly become psychic dicks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> man right <laughs> moving on okay. uh so this is um a question for both of you um have yeah. you or anna ever had paranormal experiences or strange occurrences and neither of you could um explain you know together yeah. Oh, together? You mean together. we've had an experience together? Yeah, yeah. Like, have you guys ever experienced anything together that you yeah, can't explain? Bunker. Yeah, definitely, yeah. The bunker? What, what was the other one, then? Footsteps. Why, what were you thinking? No, I don't know what you were thinking. I was thinking the bunker. The footsteps? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Next question. So, so what happened? <laughs> what happened? Come on. No, we're, 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 we're. Should we say the bunker, yeah? Yeah, we were visiting Guernsey. We were doing some filming, weren't we? I was about five months pregnant with our first child, and we were doing... um investigating um, a World War II bunker called Battery Myris in Guernsey. And uh, is this is a bunker that, have we, how many times have we investigated it before? About three times before? Yeah, three or four times before. I've had it about four times for me. And I, it just, it's a place that fills me with, yeah, <laughs> yes. it's the most, yes, yeah, the most horrendous location. And um, yeah, so I was a bit of a um, scary cat and stood outside while Kira was doing some filming in the, the deepest part of the bunker i stood outside in the gun ring which is outside we had as well. yeah we, we were locked the ourselves in two, we were the only people there we locked ourselves in yeah and the only way through it is to go through the outside bit where yeah. i was um and when so yeah standing outside and i could hear karen occasionally would shout out from the deep dark desert's bunker you know Are you all right yeah yeah fine and then about it's about 20 minutes in wasn't it and then i heard footsteps coming up to where I was like heavy footsteps like somebody wearing like dms like you were and um and it sort of stopped outside and then it, you could just like a, you could feel it like turn and then just walk, walk. you said Kieran I said so I thought it was you I thought it's, and it wasn't there's no answer and I thought oh no <laughs> <laughs> so I was like oh god so yeah just yeah I went to the where yeah just sh- I just screamed for you didn't I because basically it was just it was so clear so loud so clear you just couldn't and you <laughs> He went what what and you could just hear him like in the you know the distance he was miles like it felt like miles away well, it took me it took me a good a good few minutes five well five minutes but to a good run. few minutes yeah. to run back so i was off in the dark at the other end of completely at the other end of the bunker and i had a camera with me and was kind of focusing where i was and you can hear on the on the camera anna call out for me and i'm going yeah even to the point where i don't care now about the camera to be honest because yeah. she's screaming for me and yeah. i run back and she says yeah you heard it. You heard where you were. Do you remember you? Was that I can't remember a separate time. You heard footsteps where you were, where you were, and that's 
In the bunker. Yeah. Yeah, that was the other side in the um, in one of the rooms. Oh, that's it. That's the camera. It all gets blurred. Yeah, that was a different <laughs> part of that was a different part of the bunker, and I'm a little bit more skeptical about that because there were quite a few of us in that room, mm. and I heard footsteps outside of the room. But I always think about the acoustic properties of the bunker in terms of that. But the distance that I was to Anna and the fact that she heard it loud enough that she thought it was me coming mm. back and went, Kieran, and then there was no answer. And so then she looked around, nobody there. And then it took a time for me to run back to where she was to go, what's wrong? What's wrong? Pale as anything, shaking, nervous, because these loud footsteps have been there. So yeah, that's something I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't explain, really, to be honest. Squirrels would not make that sort of sound. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there have been, yeah, I mean, obviously we don't go into detail, because we're in, you know, here, but we've heard stuff here, haven't we? We've heard stuff together. This is one thing we will always argue about. Oh, but no, we've it's heard, the squirrels, he's already told It's you. the squirrels, they're really vocal. <laughs> <laughs> they say stuff. Yeah, yeah, we've heard something one night that both of us, you, yeah, both of us literally just said to each other, Did you just hear that? And Kieran just said, I just heard that. You, don't deny it. Oh, it's just, oh. <laughs> like, thing of horror films, that's the thing. It's a voice of like you would expect, like this demonic thing to sound like. And we heard, and it wasn't just one sentence, was it? It was like, said, do you remember? Oh, yeah. No, I don't know what the words sentence, were. One sentence, there's a pause, yeah, a and then it's another sentence, which oh, yeah. was a shorter one. And it's just, honestly. Very odd. Very odd. And there was another time <laughs> that we were... that night. <laughs> there was another time that we were genuinely speak. So uh, my older yeah. child was now 13. He was staying with us in another house, a very, very old house where we lived before. Yeah. And there was a, a very creepy moment where <laughs> Anna nudged son's talking what, what's he doing and I woke up and I could hear him whispering I could hear him whispering and we sat there and I sat there frozen thinking what is he doing who is he talking to and we kind of didn't want to move because a little bit freaked out and then all we heard from him was shh or they'll hear you and that was yeah. it I was not going to, you know, it took me, out. took me a good few minutes to get up and go. This, he had an imaginary life. friend, though, didn't he? He did have an he imaginary, had imaginary friend. friend for a while. Yeah, which was lovely. Which yes. maybe wasn't imaginary. So <laughs> that maybe was not an imaginary friend. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the footsteps in that bunker, definitely, yeah. The thing is that, yeah, there's been that, reportings. Of, you know, people have heard noises and Similar stuff, stuff yeah. There, so, so it's not it's not an isolated incident. No. But it's an, inc a, a, an experience that matches other people's experiences but that yes we kind of both shared it mm. as in we were both in the location at the time and because we were locked in and because it was the two of us we could easily yeah, verify where we were anyway. yeah yeah lovely stuff jace yeah mate what's up next one i'm, I'm just listening i know we are we all are man yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i was gonna ask something just in general like about uh fear and um like i'm sure did we have we covered fear oh really we talked about it a little bit but we didn't really talk about it did we, we just yeah it's, i think it. it's something that i wanted to go back to because it's something that interests me um about like uh fear in the sense of like because we was talking about like uh, uh Spirit and uh, ghost communication is very personal to people, and um, yeah. a fear um, plays a massive part of that because it, it panics you into believing a lot more is happening than what it actually is. Um, I mean, what's yeah. your what's your take on on fear, like within the paranormal? Absolutely, I think fear plays a huge part, a huge part. And in the Battersea Poltergeist, I use the phrase never underestimate the power of fear because fear can play havoc with your physical system so you know it, it ups your heart rate your lung capacity it makes you sweat all of those sorts of things from a physical point of view and if you are constantly at a fear level that can start to affect you physically just oh, yeah. in terms of your own physical health so if you're living in a location where there's constant stuff going on that can affect you physically but because of that it can then also have a serious impact on your sleep pattern as well. 
and if it has an impact on your sleep pattern that can affect you know your perception and your interpretation of things as well not only that fear and constant fear can affect or weaken your long-term memory so okay. when we talk about ghost investigations when we talk about a ghostly experience that we've had we're thinking about stuff way in the past yeah well fear can actually it can actually weaken the accuracy of our long-term memory so that we might think we've had a particular experience we might think we've had it but actually our accurate recall of it is not so great even and that's just memory even to the point where we know in psychology that your visual perception so how you see things and how you hear things can be severely influenced by various factors and the top three or four are fear anxiety i was going to speak about that sleep kind of dis disrupted sleep and or tiredness and stimulants like caffeine now think about what you're doing on a ghost hunt yeah there's fear potentially anxiety but there's also tiredness if you're up at two three four o'clock in the morning yeah. plus we're all potentially using stimulants, whatever that is, coffee, tea, Red Bull, you name it, to try and keep awake. All of those things can affect our perception in such a way that kind of a small mundane thing can be misinterpreted as something paranormal. So it's not, it's not taking anything away from the paranormal experiences. If anything, it's just a warning, be careful. Yeah. You know, be careful about interpreting this stuff. Even There's even some stuff that... that has been done recently some stuff i talk about in some of my work where um fear has been shown to affect tactile sensitivity and although it's a study that's looking at tactile sensitivity and the idea of touch and it has nothing to do with the paranormal what actually the studies were showing is that you misperceive things like breath or air or misperceive kind of a change in atmosphere as a touch sensation because of fear so like you're walking so you're up the stairs and your heart rate's going and you're like well i feel like i'm having a heart attack yeah stairs, or even if there's a slight a breeze even if there's a slight breeze is if the window is open or somebody breathes near you and you don't hear the breath but you feel it the fear can make you misinterpret quite mundane things as a touch sensation so therefore when people say oh you know i felt like i was touched by somebody what's going on you just need to be careful that it's not fear playing havoc with your with your perception so, so. top tips for anyone that wants to go go something don't be scared don't be scared be well rested <laughs> yeah try your best to not be anxiety out by the situation yeah and um Lay off the red don't, bill. Don't take any stimulants. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, horrible, <laughs> yes. So there, there's the uh, top four tips from Mr. Kieran and our Keith. There you go. Um, uh, having a civilised and organised investigation without any of the fear, anxiety or drugs. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you can, go on, Karen, just. That's it, I'm done, I'm done. See yeah. you later. So we're getting like a lot of questions for him. Um, like once we get through the questions, because we're going on to questions now that uh, we did put out like a post and people We've could... got one more for Anna. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm saying, you know, we put out questions out. So we're going to get through all the questions people commented on our post that we put out uh, a couple of days back. Um, and like I say, if we have time, we will then get to everyone's question. Well, not everyone, but we'll try and get uh, to people's question. Um, who are in the chat right now? But um, yeah, this one's for Anna. This this is a bit of a fun one for you. Um, I don't know if it'll be fun for Kieran, but you know, uh, tell oh, us God. something about Kieran, either personally or professionally, that people would be surprised to know. <laughs> he loves these questions. It's like <laughs> that's a really good. Who's going red? Oh, because I've got no idea what you're going to say. <laughs> that's a great question. Uh, whatever you want whatever you want personal or professional what <laughs> about what I have to get it there right no it's telling no, 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 whatever no, it is no, no, no. you want to have a sitcom say stuff it. this what is, is it? it's like what's the gold? nice thing oh, Kieran's a poet he writes he writes me poetry oh that oh God, I'm surprised that you aren't normally yeah, I mean... when we've had an argument and then he writes me a nice love 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 poem but he's an amazing poet 
Okay. Game. I mean, could you, could, <laughs> could you get one? Re re let's read it out. Could we get one? Or... Oh god, no, they're a bit. <laughs> He says, just tell me something personally. It doesn't mean I'm going to fucking show you what I do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's that is he's, awesome. To be he's fair. a terrible snorer. There you go. It's a bit more exciting. Oh, I like the poet. Bit, but never... There you go. He sleeps with one foot outside the bed at all times. Does he? What happens when two? So, no, no, I'm saying in. three. It's like three paranormal movies. Three things. You see. So what happens, Kieran, when... Um, inside the bed. I think it's I because to. he needs to make a quick exit if what? something happens. But yeah, what it has happened? to be one foot. What actually happens if both feet are under the blanket? Well, I, try, I tried... <laughs> this is the thing. It's like, just like, chaos, really... he says. <laughs> like, cold in the winter, there's been times when you've gone to bed before me and I've like tried to cover your foot. And then even in the night, if he's like, in the middle of sleep, deep like sleep. deep sleep, he will suddenly twitch and say, no, 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 you're uncovered. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, a little quirk. There you go, then. <laughs> Sounds. I think everyone would have enjoyed that. Yeah, definitely. Right. <laughs> so, so what we're going to do now? We're going to get onto the questions. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people want to know all the stuff about Mouse Haunted. You know, we'll try and get to some of that. Um, but we've got a few more, like from the people who want to know certain things. Um, I'll do um, the. I'll go on. What you can say? Stay. I'm going to because oh, it's a, an awkward thing. It's not anything. Obviously, whatever. But just um, go to your messenger. Oh, because we can't even ask Kieran if we can uh, if we can talk about it because we're on live now. He said he said he'll uh, um, he'll answer anything. Answer anything. anything. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh -oh. So anyway, I can, tell you no, I can always it, say now I'm not going to talk about it. Like, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah. That, that's that's so anyway, um, th this one is from our good friend Mr. Mark Bowner, uh, Dead Cold Paranormal, uh, and straight away he goes nerd alert here. Um, after finishing the final episode of the superb podcast, the Battersea Poltergeist, my question is, if poltergeists do not exist as an invisible entity, entity capable of moving objects and all the other well-documented things they can apparently do, could the phenomenon uh, still exist as a powerful, untapped part of the unconscious mind that only a small amount of humans in the world have the ability to do? Yes. There oh, you, yeah. you want me to say what? No, <laughs> if you want, I, I think, yeah, I think Mark because, would be happy because with that. the ju the jury's out, isn't it? It's a paranormal theory, and maybe what he's tapping into there's there's two parts he's tapping into, which is a brilliant question. Is PK so recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis? So this unconscious PK, but then there's another part of it which it could be something called tulpas. And tulpas is a thought form. So historically, it goes back. There's various cultures that talk about tulpas, where it's almost as though you are kind of building up a picture in your mind of who is responsible for possible activity, or building up a, an image in your mind, or a, or a thought in your mind about a character or an individual. But that that conjuring within your mind is so strong that you create a thought form that then becomes external, which is kind of what he's talking about. And yet, absolutely, I would say all theories are on the table. Why not? Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it is, like I say, that is a scary concept to think, you know, if you're that powerful, you can mentally do things like like that with your mind. Um, I think the end well, of it, was done, it was done with the Philip experiment in Canada, where a bunch of people got together. They said, what we're going to do for a month is we're going to sit around a table, like a seance table, and we're going to use a Ouija board, and for a month, one of us is going to fake the phenomena. And we know that that one person is going to fake the phenomena. Yeah, and we're going to create a ghost called Bill, we'll give him a whole story, and then we'll carry on communicating with this pretend ghost for a month with the Ouija board, kind of build up a story, meeting you know a few times a week. At a pre-designated moment, a month in, the person faking the phenomena will stop faking the phenomena and will just carry on. And what happened was phenomena continued and they got lots of information from Bill and lots of information and lots of phenomena happening around the table and people having physical experiences, various things happening. And it was all a completely made up ghost. Yeah. Completely made up. But it's almost as though they created this external thought form that was a pretend ghost. So 
Look that up, the Philip experiment. Yeah. I'll, I'll write that one down as well. He does say at the end of his question, he says he doesn't know which is possibly more frightening, the existence of a poltergeist or the human potential having this ability. I agree, yeah. Absolutely. I don't know which is more frightening. The, the potential that we have or the potential that spirit oh, has. If I got picked up and lobbed against a wall or thrown out of a window, I think I'd choose the poltergeist one. Yeah. <laughs> Just thrown, dashed. Unless someone was with me and it was them. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so again, we can't answer that question. So, yeah, are we just are we just going down a mood point all the while, man? It's 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 ridiculous. Uh, we got another question from uh, Danny Cutmore. Um, he said he'd be interested in to know Kieran's opinion on studies on near death experiences. Does he believe that the mind is in the metaphysical world or only active in the living brain? Uh, again, I think that's personal subjective experience to think whether or not that's true. You know, if you believe in an afterlife, then yep. there's a potential for your mind to be in another, another metaphysical domain. And people's ND experiences, near-death experiences, you know, they hint at a possible afterlife in terms of the archetypal going down a tunnel of light, encountering people that have passed over, the feeling of warmth, kind of a very positive sensation, all of that, and kind of reaching an end point. There are all these common factors in near-death experiences. I think the most interesting part of the NDE studies is the stuff that Raymond Moody and Sam Parnia did, where they worked at a Southampton Hospital and also New York Hospital, where an aspect of an NDE is, a, is an out-of-body experience. Yeah. So when people are having a near-death experience, often they sometimes get an out-of-body experience at the same time, where they float above their body and they're looking down on their body. And what they did in some of these operating theatres, because a lot of the near-death experiences happen in that sort of context where somebody's being operated on and kind of, you know, the, the flat line and they kind of go into that and then they go out of their body and then they have the near-death experience. What they did was they set up a box on the ceiling and in that box was a random number generator. I think it was like a 10-figure number and it would randomly generate once an hour a number might have been more frequent than that but it randomly gen generated the number the only way you could know what that number was is if you were lying flat yeah. on the ceiling so if you had an out-of-body experience and we're going up to the ceiling could you actually see that number and if you speak to raymond moody and sam parnia parnia who did the study they'll say there were some convincing cases of people actually being able to recount the numbers I think that's okay. the most interesting studies. Yeah. And, uh, do you think that's meditative state though? Um, like so, like your your body's at a point where it's it's incapable of doing anything, so your mind um, detaches itself, and then you basically meditate, and then it, that's a part of that experience as well. Not so much a near death yeah, experience. Yeah, it could it could it could easily be that, or you, or even you know aspects of your brain shutting down. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good explanation in terms of the tunnel vision that the the. The tunnel that you go down the feeling of warmth and yeah. kind of almost religiosity the encounter with people in the afterlife a lot of the experiences that people have in ended can be explained by the brain actually shutting down your vision yeah. kind of narrowing down you know your body's way of coping with the pain and with dying and you have that kind of very comfort and positive experience so that's one particular idea the meditative one is yeah it's, it's almost a coping mechanism my body's going to you know, is going into some sort of painful or crisis or traumatic moment. So actually to cope with that, I'm going to separate myself. Yeah. You know, and so it potentially could be a coping mechanism in that respect. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I know that. I know yeah. Um, a question uh, to both of you from UK Yvonne. Uh, where is the most haunted place you two have ever been to? It doesn't have to have been together, but just... You know, separately or together, you know, whichever. What's the most haunted place you've ever been to? Well, the bunker would be there. So the, so, so the bunker, we've talked about the bunker. You can yeah, obviously yeah. understand that the, you know, World War II bunker on Guernsey or Battery Myris is, would be up there in terms yeah, of definitely. our most haunted places. So, yeah, I would say there, definitely. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. Oxford Castle is pretty good. Yeah. Hellfire Caves is good. Oh, Hellfire Caves, there's a good one. Yeah, we've never done those, obviously. Oh, no, never know. Hellfire Caves. We've both investigated Hellfire Caves, but never together. Okay. So Anna, Anna, 
Yeah, and you've done I did it. a charity event there. You did a charity yeah, event lots there. Kicked had, yeah, it all kicked off. It all kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> all kicked off. Yeah, that was good. Um... Yeah, so Hellfire Cave, definitely. And I like Hellfire Cave. It's one of the first, although I'd done some investigations when I was a lot younger, I ended up doing an investigation of Hellfire Caves and the hill just up from the caves mm. that leads up to the mausoleum when I was about 16. I spent the night there kind of up until about two, three o'clock in the morning, back in the day when um, um, locations used to say, how much will it cost us for you yeah. to spend the night rather than us mm -hmm. pay the location? The location would ask us. And I was a 16 year old and I was like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Don't want any money and, you know, ended up investigating. It was brilliant. So Hellfire Caves, I think, is a brilliant location. And we went back there, didn't we? The only time we'd been back there together was when Ghost Adventures were there. Zach Fagans right. and the guys. So we knew, um, I know um, uh, the location scout, kind of the location manager of uh, Ghost Adventures, um, an amazing guy called Jeff Ballinger, who's kind of an amazing historian in the paranormal world. And he said to me, in around the London Olympics, when the London Olympics happened, the Ghost Adventures would like to do some investigations kind of around the London area. Have I got any tips for locations? And I, you know, we came back with the usual London dungeons, you know, various places in London. He said, well, these are all being done to death, basically, in America. We're not really interested in those. Is there anything else? And I said, well, it depends how far out you want to go. And so then we ended up recommending Hellfire Caves, which, of course, is quite a distance out of London. If you watch the episode, they have all of these segues of the, the, the skyscapes of, of London, the Tower of London, the London Bridge, Big Ben. And they go ghost adventures investigated at the most haunted location in London. And they show all of this and then they go Hellfire Caves, which of course is out in West Wickham in Buckinghamshire, like an hour away. Yeah. <laughs> but that's but Anna and I ended up going because Jeff said, Well, you know, it, you could be, you know, they'll they'll interview you because it's a location you know really well. So why don't you just go along? So we met them. They were really nice, weren't they? Yeah, that was back in the day. Around. That was back in the day when it was Zach. Yeah, Nick and Aaron. Yeah, Aaron was lovely. So, yeah. saying that, but he was really nice. Oh, Aaron was amazing, was really, really amazing. But they ended up, so I, it was a, a funny moment when um, Zach said to me, right, we're going to just do a little interview with you and then, you know, you're, you're free to go and whatever. And we were filming about halfway down the caves and he said, Kieran, the questions we're going to ask you when we film are, we want to know a little bit about you know what parapsychology is we want to know a little bit about your research we want to know why you know about hellfire caves if you can give us a little bit of history about it and some of the hauntings associated with it and then maybe some of your theories about what might be going on in terms of normal explanations and then maybe kind of a question or two because we know that you've got an interest in demonology that sort of thing so does that sound okay in terms of the questions and i said yeah that's absolutely fine no problem and Zach went, okay, camera ready. Yep, fine. Sound, yep, absolutely fine. Kieran, are there demons in here? And that was his first question. Are there demons in here? So I just went, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you think there are, then there are. <laughs> it was only then that he asked all of the other questions. But short filming it was short filming. Yeah, it was a very short interview. We cut it very short after that. But no, Hellfire Caves, I think, is we it. We got told off, didn't we? For filming, they were filming. Yeah, like, my but... brother and I were like in the middle of this. Hellfire Caves has got this middle section, like a big, where they used to do all the weird orgies and stuff going on. Like, That's right, the Hellfire Club. <laughs> Hellfire Club. And uh, yeah, my brother and I were just, I think we were scuffing pebbles or something, but we got told off by this camera. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah, you was doing? a bit mortified. But anyway. That's very funny. Um, but yeah, Hellfire <laughs> Caves and yeah. the Bunker and the Oxford Castle as well. We Oxford, like Oxford Castle. Castle. And I think that's I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. Because we haven't done a huge number together, have we? Not but together. Those, those kind of handful. No. Just really. trying to think where else. Because I used to cover Southeast Chan Channel Islands. So I'm just trying to think where else. Okay. No, I no. think that's it. Yeah, it really? There you go. Well, that covers yeah. that then. Yeah. Alcatraz. <laughs> Alcatraz. But we have never been there. So. <laughs> Let's see. We've got to organise this Alcatraz. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Fort Whitley in Fort. Fort Whitley, yeah, Fort Whitley in Portsmouth. Brilliant. Fort Whitley is where I pushed the group of participants into the wall, so that's quite cool. Yes, Anna was that scared. She pushed some <laughs> participants into the wall in her what quick you, oh, exit. You just just pushed them out of the way and just yeah, let's see. I can say it now because I don't know about anymore. But yeah, my, my volunteer and I, um, Tanya, we were just yeah, we scared ourselves. We heard something between us. 
like a breath yeah. and we're just in the dark we just started running and i yeah these participants just got in the way so i just we just shoved them into the wall accidentally <laughs> and ended up having to do first aid on them so it wasn't <laughs> You say yeah, I shoved them into the wall accidentally. It's... And I'll stampede to get out of the room. <laughs> so, yeah, we used to have great fun of those events. Yeah. <laughs> Just wanted to get there. Um, there's uh, another question from Rebecca Gintz. What have you experienced? This is for both of you, by the way. Uh, what have you experienced that convinced you that there is some kind of existence beyond this life, if there is any? I should put that at the end of that. Um, I'll, I'll answer first because it's a negative. Yeah. And then I'll leave, I'll leave kind of the convincing yeah. experience to Anna. Yeah. That's an amazing experience. But for me, it's it's negative because um, I don't think I've had any experiences that would convince me that there is an afterlife. The belief okay. in the afterlife is a whole separate factor. And we could talk about my Irish Roman Catholic upbringing and all of that. That's separate. But an actual experience that convinces me that there's an afterlife, no. I've had some spooky experiences. SS Great Britain and walking into the lower class accommodation and felt spooked and that was quite significant but it wasn't enough for me to think there is an afterlife so no and and you shouldn't be surprised at that I don't think anybody should be surprised at that because I always remain skeptical I'm always looking for natural explanations so yeah not the case for me but for Anna well just Ghost. the significance yeah. of the, the office Oh, the office. Oh, God. Oh, the office. Um, yeah, so I think my most significant experience, uh, the biggest, the scariest one for me was um, I used to work, when I was working for a charity, we used to work in an old um, house that was listed, really, really old house. The staircase is so old, it was in the Doomsday Book. It was just ancient, creaking, horrible place. And um, I was staying late one night and it's um, doing some uh, stuff in the basement. They used to have this basement where they used to hang all the meat and stuff. So it's quite a spooky looking basement. But I was doing, I think it was about 10 o'clock at night. I was working late. Um, and the, the couple that used to live in the house, uh, one of them, oh, I don't know what's going to be watching from our charity, hopefully. But yeah, one of them had died, had died and then the other one had gone into a home. And that's like a few weeks before this happened. So it's quite recent working down in the basement and um i just forgot that they weren't there and it was just i was walking i was working away for about an hour and then i heard talking just like muffled voices like you'd hear in another room like muffled voices talking yeah. and just thought oh it's mr and mrs whoever they were and just carried on working and then um then i heard what sounded like a chair scrape on the floor and it was then <laughs> It was then, you know, only the hair stand on your end, the back of your neck. It's only ever happened a couple of times in my life, but that's what happened. I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> There's, they're not here anymore. There's nobody upstairs. So I thought, right, I'm going to pack up now and I'm going to get, like, I'm just going to go home. So I started switching off all the lights, went into those like four offices in this bottom floor, got my, uh, got it switched off the lights in two of the rooms. And then it was when I was, oh, then I was walking past the stairs, which led to the front door. I stopped. To this day, I said to you, I wish to God I hadn't looked up because what I saw coming down that stairs, and my hands are shaking now because it's just the most, it's so clear. And it was it was just this this blob. The only thing I could describe it is like a blob, had no shape to it, but just fast moving blob coming down the stairs towards me. Yeah. And thank, thank God <laughs> that my keys were near the next door. There. My keys are near the door and I just grabbed my keys and I ran out of there and I left the place unlocked and just went straight home to my dad had to swallow a whiskey and he came back with me to lock up it was the most terrifying thing i have ever experienced in my life it was just i can't it describe sounds it. really it bad was, <laughs> I mean, it was all the build-up to it it was just like you know it's all the noises it's like that you know it's the horrible dawning realization that there was the voices that was the sound of the you know the, the chair moving and then it was like the you know i think it obviously built it up in my life okay there's you know something's not right here <laughs> And then yeah. it's what I saw, and I there's no doubt in my mind what I saw. So yeah, yeah, so, that's yeah, amazing. My voice is took... <laughs> this is like really like. Yeah, yeah I can't. Okay. Whenever I tell it, I either cry or my hands start shaking. Well, really, really terrifying. That petrifying, but... yeah, yeah. yeah. But I always wonder what would happen if I hadn't if I'd stopped. I mean, it's sad, yeah. isn't it? That I said, like, I'd love that to happen to me because it's oh. I can see how scared you are of like of how it happened to you. But I mean, I would yeah. actually like that to happen to me. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love it to happen. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we're going to um, question for Kieran uh, from Missy and me. This could be a bit of a controversial one, but I don't know. It's, well, I'll read it out anyway. It is a controversial one. Yeah. I can't um, wait for the answer. What is your opinion on the connection between ghosts, the Fae, and aliens? Have you ever enco encountered any Fae or aliens? <laughs> So I did some alien investigation, goblin investigation, kind of out in the kind of weird ethereal kind of fringe areas of parapsychology. So I've done that. Not Fay, no. Um, however, the connection between the three, I think, is really interesting. So I've written a paper called, um, which is about, it's called the, uh, the John Hall story. Um, and it's about something called haunted people syndrome, which, which we're putting forward as a team. And it's not saying that there's a psychiatric diagnosis here, but it's saying that things like alien encounters, ghost encounters, fey encounters, all of these, there's commonality between them. And part of it is down to your interpretation. Yeah. You know, so one person might have a ghostly encounter, another person might have exactly the same encounter, but not interpret it as a ghost. They might interpret it as the presence of an alien. And we were looking at stories of alien encounters and something called satellite terrorism, which is this sense of almost like a men in black type stalking, you know, and the people having those experiences when they report some of the phenomena, it sounds almost identical to a ghost experience. Yeah. And it's basically just saying all of these could be different interpretations of the same thing. And maybe that's not the answer that, that she was looking for terms of thinking about a link but kind of that's how i see that they could be linked so it's like three different cameras watching the same thing being all interpreted in different exactly yeah. yeah exactly yeah, I like that. I don't, it's all interested to me I, don't, I love talking about this kind of stuff um we're going to get into the most haunted questions now jace we'll skip so that this is the most haunted there's a few questions. yes there's, there's a, a few and then when we do these few, um, because, I th you know, then we'll, well, actually, we'll just see how long we get, how long it takes to get through these. Could be fast, could be long, who knows? So, yeah, here are the mouse haunted ones. Um, and I'm sure you people will love it. Is that all I'm saying? There's they're a lot all of, from there. They're, they're, they're uh, from uh, most of them. Yeah, a, lot, a lot of questions in, in the chat that I'm seeing today. It's like a lot of people want to know mouse haunted. So hopefully we can get to your questions. But, yeah, Griff, you want to go with the, the very first mouse haunted one? Yeah, so we've um we've got one from uh Dono Dovan Newton, um and it's what location would you like to revisit which you covered with most haunted in the UK or I was just gonna say in the yeah. world wherever you've covered the world with most haunted. Uh, for me, two locations. One is Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, yeah. because we investigated there and it was a seven-hour live. Um. And so, of course, when we investigated it, because it was a seven hour live for the Travel Channel, it was just enormous. The team that was going on behind the scenes in terms of cameras and production meant that it was just, I mean, you had like over 100 people there who were responsible for making sure that this thing worked in terms of the production side of things. So to go back to Eastern State Penitentiary without any of that and just investigate it would be absolutely that would be phenomenal for me. I would love to do that. Um, West Virginia State Penit Penitentiary as well. We did that as a team. And there was some stuff that happened there that I particularly liked. And I'd love to go back and investigate. But another one that might be an answer to another question, which is around kind of the best, you know, one of the best places is uh, Tyndale Farm um, in Pendle Hill because of the stuff that happened there. Um, unfortunately, you can't go back there and investigate now, but that would be a dream to go back and just investigate with different people and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, I did, yeah. uh, I did see like a few, um, quite a few people have been talking about Pendle Hill. Um, yeah. A lot of people loved it. Um, I mean, I'm, I might as well, consider we're talking about Pendle Hill, I'll do one of the questions right now from Anne Metallica. Um, question for you, Kieran, please. Uh, what are your thoughts still from the Mouse Haunted Live um, when you went to that farmhouse in Pendle Hill back in 2004, when everything turned into chaos? Yeah. What are um, your thoughts? My, my thoughts are still that that was one of the best locations, the best investigations we did, just because of everything that happened. So, you know, at some point, if people remember, we actually lost footage, just like we have with Griff. Yeah. Where the screen goes black. 
and there's just nothing there. There's no feet, and that's kind of the worst thing that can happen in in t the TV world, just to have it just go black and lose the feed. But it happened because we lost the cameraman. The cameraman felt like something was touching the back of his head, and with everything else that happened, he felt the back of his head, saw that there was, or felt that there was nothing there, even though he felt it being touched, and just collapsed, collapsed down on the table, and lost the feed to the camera. And that was after we'd already had two or three other people collapse and have to be taken out and dealt with by paramedics. So I still look back at it at the same, with the same perception that I had then, which was like, it was like being a medic in a battlefield. You didn't know what was going to happen. People were dropping like flies and it was amazing. I still think there was hysteria going on. Um, hysteria, a bit of group conformity. I think one of the members of the crew had a form of strider, which meant they had difficulty breathing, and it yeah. was the dustiest place that we've ever been to. So I think that might have played a, 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 an effect. But yeah, absolutely. And people, it's stuck in people's minds as an amazing live to the extent where the number of people that say to me, you know that last night of that Halloween live that you did in Pendle Hill, how amazing it was. And I always have to correct people and say, no, it was a three night live and that was the second night. Yeah, it was. So yeah, I, 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 re I recently watched it pretty re uh, recently, yeah. And the third night, not a lot really happened, did it? Uh, but it was just weird to go from that and then to finish with a final night, you know, and go, yeah, it's kind of anything after that is going to be anticlimactic. So, yeah, fantastic. I still look back at it kind of with a weird fondness because it was amazing, but, yeah, it was just bizarre, bizarre. Um, this is a good question. Uh, I can't remember. I don't. I, well, I don't even know who done this one. Could, this could be one of our questions. But can you share any secrets or lesser-known facts about Mouse Haunted? Any secrets or lesser-known facts? That's an interesting one. Um. Oh, <laughs> yes, I could. I'm just wondering what I could say without getting a phone call from any lawyers. Um. Yes, I could. Uh, well, people might not know, because it might not have been quite obvious on Most Haunted, Carl Beatty was the biggest Elvis fan ever, and probably still is. Huge, huge Elvis fan. So frequently, um, when we weren't on camera, he would be recounting Elvis stories or singing Elvis songs, and it often kept um, the crew amused. But that's one particular secret you may not know. Um, an encyclopedic knowledge of Elvis. I mean, just just uh, uh, phenomenal. I'm trying to think if there's anything else that that the crew. Um, anything else? I'm trying to think. I guess a part of it is also the number of mediums that we had. You know, we had a, a a fascinating array of mediums with loads of different backgrounds. People often think about Derek and David Wells as being the the mediums from Most Haunted, but actually, if you go through all of the series there were easily about 20 mediums that were involved in the show at some point or another. We went through a whole two or three series having guest mediums on almost every episode. Um, and I think that was fantastic if people actually look back at it and see that that was the case. So, yeah, so there was that. I think the other good, good secret is to compare the lives to the episodes. In the lives, for those that actually came to any of the lives and saw the studio, you will realize with the lives that there are literally, like I said about Eastern State Penitentiary, about 100, 150 people behind the scenes that are making that show work. And they did an amazing job with kind of satellites, with the electrical side of things, Stage Electrics, a company that did the electric side of things. So amazing array of people that made that production work. The episodes, it was just us. It was just the team. And I think that's often surprising for people because they think that it's the same level of production and there's a lot going on behind the scenes. But actually, no, what you saw on camera and the people you saw on camera, that was it. There was nobody else. So, you know, it was it was never more than 10 people on an investigation, maybe eight, nine people. But it was, you know, Yvette, Carl, Stuart, myself, um, you know, the medium, a few others, Kath as well a very small number of people that would actually go in and investigate and film at the same time. So I think that's a lovely thing to be aware of, to know that there wasn't all of this behind the scenes stuff going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to do the next one, Jace? Lisa door. It's all kicking off or something outside. 
is it? Yeah, there's something going on. I might have to go out there, be that nosy neighbour or something, you know what I mean? Anyway, next question. Uh, is it Lisa Door? Lisa Door, Lisa Door. This is a long one. Um, I'd love to know what is this? Yeah, yeah, this is, is for it, all of us. Am I going to read this out? Is, yeah, yeah, read it all. I'm going to ask myself this. All right, we're, we're going with this. I'd love to know what both you, Stan Griff, and Kieran think about knocking replies that most haunted gets all the time on their shows. Do you think it's real? And why do other paranormal investigators not get the same phenomenon? It seems to me it's a most haunted thing. I've never actually seen another program that gets so much knocking and tapping that seems to be as intelligent and as responsive as the most haunted team gets. Well, part of that is not true. Because people think it's just most haunted. The Battersea Poltergeist, classic, classic example of constant knocking. Yeah. constant knocking if you look at some of the reports from enfield would be the same as well there are other shows paranormal state where they used to get quite a bit of knocking and intelligent knocking so there are other examples but certainly it became almost from about series five or six a mainstay of the investigation no matter where we went it felt like there was the knocking and i'm not speaking out of turn by saying my interpretation of it is i think there was something natural going on rather than supernatural yeah. I frequently used to say on camera when people would challenge me and say, come on, Kieran, look, we're around the seance table. There's knocking going on. You can see everybody's feet. You know, what do you think's going on? You must be impressed by this. And I would always say, everybody take off their shoes and socks and then I'll be impressed. And I always used to say it publicly and I've said it on camera on the show. And, and I still stand by that. And I still stand by that with any investigation where there would be knocking. Because there's always the potential for somebody causing that knocking. Yeah. You know, if you can take everybody's shoes and socks off and it's still happening, I'd be more impressed by that. And it just never, never happened in terms of putting that control in place. You know, so as, as impressed as the you know various members of the team were, as impressed as some people are on investigations, I'm not so impressed by that. But the reason for that is because of the history of this sort of thing. When you look back into the 1850s and the Fox sisters who were responsible for the beginnings of spiritualism, part of what they were doing relied on the fact that they were wearing shoes and socks. And then they were able to cause a clicking noise that when they had their feet on the floor, it caused a little tapping sound. So because you know about the history of this sort of thing, yeah. therefore when it occurs in modern times, you think, well, there could easily be the same thing going on there. Just have you ever had an investigation where you asked everyone to take the shoes and socks off and they did? Never. Oh, man. Not. I would have done we, it. We, I would have took it straight We off. would partake straight in there. Yeah, I probably yeah. wouldn't have asked you two to do it, though. But... Oh. <laughs> Just give it. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, for me and Griff, like, we've had little bits of tapping, but I think I know, you know, what they mean. Like, um, I've seen on, like, a lot of videos... They always get like tapped into like every question, you know, everywhere and anywhere. Um, and before I was, you know, done any of the paranormal, that was the one thing I, I couldn't wait to start doing. Uh, you know, going to investigations and just hearing that tapping for myself. Uh, but me and Griff very rarely ever get that tapping on command or so precise or intelligent. We never really get it. <laughs> Um, so we had one. We had one really good, yeah, every, really like, good one. Yeah, every, like the, 130 um, yeah, investigations. Yeah, I mean, like, there was I mean, only one. So, it's so small, but we had a really good one at um, 39 degree street. 39 degree street. We we did a little churn and it finished the churn for us, and that was that was mad. And there's only us two at the time, wasn't there? Only yeah. That one section. So that was really good. But um, yeah, like we don't get much tapping whatsoever. So but again, he goes to Kieran. You know, are, are they doing it with the feet? You know, unless you're there, and we can take it all off, it's it's all question marks. Unfortunately, it just says take it all off, <laughs> clothes a lot, <laughs> take it all, necklaces, off. rings, get them off. I want to see. But they're you also there. they're also decades, decades and decades and decades of accounts of people in seance in seance rooms. You know, at the turn of the century, the early 1900s, all the way up until kind of the 1950s, of people getting that intelligent knocking within a spiritualism domain. So there is kind of evidence there that people point to. Yeah. But anyway, that's my thoughts. Um, a question from Mr. Biff. Uh, with reference to Creed Kafer incident, um, does hindsight 
say merely the power of suggestion is strong enough to put that into Derek's mind and make him say that regardless. Yes, yeah, so people are commenting about stuff that they can find publicly about that incident. But absolutely, I think, why not? That could easily be the case. The same way that I said at the time, this only points to raising kind of a sceptical viewpoint about those particular episodes. Likewise, I've had people come to me and say, he's, you know, he's a, an amazing man. He's given me some amazing readings in, in the context of a theatre or one-to-one -one readings, or there's been some episodes where he came up with information that's just amazing. How can you counter those incidents? And I can't. Absolutely, I can't. But in those couple of incidents where there was a, you know, a bit of a setup, then there's a sceptical perspective. And that's all I'm saying. And that's all I've said publicly is that, you know, absolutely, if people have had personal subjective experiences that are more convincing and highly accurate, then then that's for them. But I think the question there about it being possible suggestion. Yes, absolutely. That that's a you know a perfectly viable explanation for what could have happened. Yeah. You wanna go on the Penny Smith one, Griff? Penny Smith. Yeah, number eighteen. Well, Penny, Penny Smith. Smith. She would like to know if it bothered you that Fred Bat summoning demons also, did you find Derek good to work with? Did it bother me that Fred Bat summoned demons? Yeah. Is that it does, a question? Yeah, yeah. Fred Bat, um, who's obviously with Mouse Haunted now, does he bother you that he summoned demons on episodes of Mouse Haunted today? No, it doesn't. It doesn't bother me because the demons aren't affecting me. So it doesn't bother me in that respect. From an ethical perspective, I think there's a little bit of a concern that people might see that and then try and mimic what they're seeing yeah. out in investigations themselves and try might try themselves to summon demons. And whilst, you know, I'm incredibly sceptical about the whole demonology side anyway, you know, and I think a perfectly natural explanation for what people are experiencing in that sort of domain, if people believe in that sort of stuff, then I think maybe there's an issue there with people trying to replicate what happens with what Fred does. Yeah. Um, but that's his particular approach. You know, I, I can't say that there's one approach to investigations that's the right approach. It would be arrogant of me to say it, and that's his particular approach. Um, as for Derek, yeah, we got on famously. And did, did we do um, also? What did you find Derek was Derek good to work with? Yeah, he just says. He says yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fascinating. Yeah, so well, we, both, we both saw things from very different perspectives, of course. The same way that um, David Wells and I see things from different perspectives. You know, there's a mediumistic viewpoint. Yeah. In terms of the phenomena, in terms of what you do, and then there's the scientific perspective. So. Absolutely, you know, able to work with um, very well, but obviously have very different perspective on things. Yeah, I mean, he was great to watch. It was always good to see you two together. Um, shame, you know, we, we, we'll never have that ever again. You know, God rest yeah. his soul. Um, because, because, you know, that was the dream team, like pretty much, you know, the old classic Master Haunted uh, crew. Um, you know, it'd been great to see like a reunion with all of you guys again. You know, you, Richard, uh, Derek, that would have been amazing. Well, anyway, um, this is this is quite a, a good question. This is from Steve Rolf. Uh, did you enjoy your school dinners at the John Hamden School in High uh, Wickham? I think uh, his mother used to be the cook, and she remembers you. You're kidding! <laughs> You're absolutely kidding. <laughs> well, that, so, <laughs> just to clarify, when I was 14 years old, we moved to High Wickham, not far from West Wickham caves hellfire caves and yeah i went to john hamden grammar school and yes i do remember the dinners and i absolutely love them so tell your mum thank you very much for those dinners <laughs> that's, absolutely good superb. Question, that is. that's a brilliant good question but well, which was your favorite dinner from school oh uh, well i i i made i guess it's my i don't know if it's my background i love potatoes yeah. Absolutely love potatoes, and my favourite dinner was jacket potato chips. What? Okay. Well, oh, combined. Yeah. So did you put jacket butter on your jacket potato, potato and then stick some chips in it as well, or yeah. bit of cheese? Oh, stunning. Absolutely. <laughs> I think they made a mean cottage pie as well at John Hampton Grammar. I do remember that. So if, if Steve's mum was responsible for that, then big, big shout out to her for that as well. That was lovely. <laughs> Oh, oh man. man. 
Um, <laughs> and you know what? This is going to be our last question. And before... Okay, um, so and this is from the quick fire round. Yeah, before the quick fire one. Or unless you want to take any more from our lovely audience, we've still got 337 people watching. Oh, my ma massive, massive thank you to everyone who's still sticking around. You know, we, we're coming up to nearly two hours. Holy shit. Um, but it's yeah, been thank fun though. I mean, yeah. it's, been, it's been great. I just enjoyed it. And, 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 and I suppose this is the big one. Uh, that I mean, the thing is, I, we had this question a lot. Um, did Carl and Stuart from Mouse Haunted fake most of the activity because he damn sure seems that way? Remember, that's not from me. That's from all absolutely. the lovely audience. So. Yeah, and the, and, and the answer is I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. But looking at it from an audience perspective, I would have the same reaction when Carl and Stuart would say at some point during the evening, we're going to go off and do an investigation ourselves. We're going to go off and do a vigil, just the two of us. Because you could be guaranteed they'd come back with footage of phenomena yeah but i'm not yeah. saying anything out of turn because i would you know i'd be saying that publicly and say that on camera that yes i'd be concerned about when they'd go off and do an investigation themselves and and often we used to vary up you know who was on those investigations to try and mix it up so that you know potentially things wouldn't happen but yeah i have the same perspective but then you're asking the wrong person aren't you because i'm skeptical about you know a lot of this stuff anyway so yeah. being involved in a tv show like that and seeing people constantly constantly have phenomena happen around them you either take the skeptical perspective which is mine or you take a spiritual perspective and say there was something about them that attracted the phenomena you know yeah. you choose whichever interpretation you want exactly um so we'll i hope... leave it in your hands guys it's up to you to decide so exactly so yeah, yeah man um you know what this has been amazing i've enjoyed this uh yeah, this has been great. if you if i mean if you guys want to see kieran o'keefe and the lovely anna joining us again on the live stream you know let us know down below um what do you want to do now shall we do wrap-up questions or do you want to answer some questions from the public or we could save that for another day it's totally up to you guys should we do the quick fire round yeah. Let's do the quick fire round. Right, we're going to do the quick fire round then. Um, so we've got five <laughs> quick fire <laughs> questions. Game, so like and then what we're going to do, uh, we'll try and sort something out again. You know, obviously if Anna and Kieran want to do it, and we'll do something like this again. And this time we'll open up the chat to everyone. I've seen a lot of questions go up. I don't think we're going to have time. Like say, it's it's two hours. Madness, to be honest, the amount of people trying yeah. to get in the questions and wow. stuff. So, so you know what I mean? Stay, stay ready for a part two. You know, if we can get it sorted. I mean, you're up for that one, Kieran. It's not, it's not <laughs> Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, I'm pushing yeah, it on him. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're just pushing it on him. They They're doing it anyway. <laughs> yeah, then you... Just send us a hoodie. We'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no trouble. So, anyway, guys, wrap up questions. So, I just quick... want to do an investigation. Yeah, that's all. That's, that's... Oh, that's it. Yeah, no, we're going to do an investigation. We do an investigation before part two because then we can talk about the investigation. <laughs> yeah, 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 we can yeah, talk man. about the investigation. Um, massive thank you to Jessica for the one pound forty nine donation. Uh, thank you so much for that. So, these questions are going to be for both Anna and Kieran. So, straight up, favorite original Ghostbuster character? Venkman. Slimer. Slimer, that's it. Yeah, man, it's good. Just good carry answer. on, next one. Quick yeah, I, I, I like that. The, the slime, I mean, that got me off guard. I weren't expecting that one. Um, considering, you know, I'm going to throw mine in there. I love Vigo, Vigo the Carpathian. Uh, I was telling Kieran before we, we started the live stream, some of you guys might have even seen um, in some of our videos, like when I was talking to my daughter after we come back from um, a boating holiday, you might have seen a, um, a big portrait of Vigo at the top of my stairs. Love Vigo. Um, He's incredible. Absolutely love him. Um, Griff, who's your favourite Ghostbuster character? Well, I have to say it's Lima as well. This is just silly, eh? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just one of them. It's just like, it's all going about the place. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not like as massive fan as, um, as you guys as Ghostbusters. But I have watched all of the Ghostbusters, obviously. But it's uh, even the girl one. Me and Steve, what's that together? I think they're well, at the like cinema. That. Yeah, it was quite funny. Oh, oh, the third one. The first, is it the like, third it's, one? It's like the, the reboot remake. The reboot, yeah. We watched for that Afterlife, and, um, though. The yeah. yeah no. One coming out, the new one. Yeah, yeah we're looking forward to that, the new one. Um, slimer as well, but... Yeah, um, I like this one. What profession, other than your own, would you love to try? Midwife. Oh, midwife. 
<laughs> that would be traumatising. The amount of Same screaming and pain. And, uh, and the, the, just the sea parting now. And now why, man? No, but you, you, what you call it, you're looking at the negatives of it. You get negatives. Uh, I'm thinking of the horrors. That's that's true horror. I'll have, I'd have a poltergeist <laughs> any day of the week than, than seeing that. I mean, uh, thank you so much for the £5 super chat. Uh, very, very appreciative. I remember when my, when my girlfriend was in labour and he was just... I couldn't look at that section. Like the the toilet door, I had to go like at the danger end. You know, I couldn't. Uh, fair play though, fair play for wanting to be a midwife. Uh, midwife. Absolutely. Um, but and Kieran wanted to be an astronaut. You know, that'd be amazing. But you know, I, I'm actually like petrified when I see. I'm scared for the astronauts, you know, like like pretty recently with that SpaceX. Um, oh, yes. When you've seen the live stream of them and they're all sitting there for like hours just getting prepared, ready to take off. I was nervous mm-hmm. for them. Um, he didn't say SpaceX. He said SpaceX. Yeah, SpaceX. <laughs> SpaceX, yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Janet, for becoming an Ouija family member. <laughs> this but... is a child friendly show. <laughs> <laughs> After water shed, it's not warm. I think actually that'd be yeah it's um, yeah. yeah it's yeah um okay. favorite yeah. pastime or hobby oh, God. Uh, for me it'd be piano okay playing the piano been playing since I was age four so for me it'd be that I love, I love well I'm I'm <laughs> what was it because we can't it's just gone dead the voice no, reading 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 Anna love loves reading, reading. You used to love reading. <laughs> So, so when we was at um, East Drive, it would have been nice to hear you on the uh, Outer Tune piano. Yeah, you should, you should have passed them some uh, tunes. I think next time we do a live stream, that's how we should open it up. Kieran on the piano. Um, and we can ask for requests, and Kieran can yeah, just yeah. bang some bang some riffs out. I'll um, try and get some vocals over it. If there was, there was actually... Down. Here's a little secret about Most Haunted. You asked me a question, a secret about Most Haunted that nobody knows. We did an investigation alive, and if people can remember, please let me know, because I always forget the location. We did a live investigation, and before we were due to start, about half an hour before, as a team, and this included the people that are in the studio, and Yvette, and everybody, we said, right, let's have a bet. Let's have a bet, and whoever gets the first Ghostbusters reference in live on the show wins the bet, and everybody put in a couple of quid. We started the show, we were outside a building, outside a room, and we started the show walking into a bar area, right? And Yvette had already thought, oh, I'm going to say this, and other people said, oh, I'm going to say this. And the show started, we walked into the bar area, and the first thing within one second that we passed was a piano, and I pressed the high keys, and I went, they hate that, and I won the bet. Nice one. Yeah. So let me know what location that was, because I always forget, always forget. But that was brilliant. Um, thank you, Sarah and Jason, for your donations. Greatly appreciated. It's all right. It's all right, um, it's all right yeah. Cheers, man. Um, um, <laughs> do you want to do the, the number four one, Jace? Yeah, I'll do the number four. If you could only listen to one song or album for the rest of your life, what song or album would that be? I know what mine would be. Do, do you know, that's a, that's a pretty... What, I'm going to choose the album every time. So the, this question. For well, the album with that song on. No, no, one song or album. So you're going to choose the album yeah, with that song on. You, of course you'll always, always go for an album, surely. But then maybe the question should be, what album? Forget song, what album? Right. If you could only listen to one album for the rest of your life, what would it be? There you go. You always laugh at me whenever I say no. Mine. I'm not gonna laugh. Well, because I speak Steve's laugh. I'm gonna laugh. I'm saying it. He's, he's, he's not gonna a laugh. Huge U2 but... fan, and and everyone, I, every time I say that, I'm like, oh god. Yeah, I used to be a huge U2 fan, so it's Action Baby for me. Okay. For me, it would be the album Stupid or Stupid by Snot. <laughs> okay. That would be mine. My... Again, laugh. <laughs> We're equal. And I said, she said, said, now laugh at mine, and then she's just laughing her head off. At yours. <laughs> oh no, yeah, <laughs> savage that is. It's like double that stand up. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know what? Considering we're on the topic uh, of favorite album, I think mine's a very easy one. Um, it's going to be from a band called Mudvayne, and it's going to be the LD50 album. That is an album I could That's listen to uh, forever. Album. It's a great album. Have you heard that, Kieran? 
Yeah, Mudvayne. Well, have you listened to Snot? Do you know <laughs> Snot? I have heard of I have heard of <laughs> you Snot. You spoke about Snot if last time we met. If you listen to Snot, given that that is my favourite album, you'll understand why I'll have listened to Mudvayne. Okay. Because there, there's a whole genre, kind of there's a mix of genre. Although although Snot is kind of Californian new new wave metal punk or punk metal, you know, there's a lot of crossover there. I listen to a lot of kind of those sorts of things and various other kind of related stuff. So yeah, Mudvayne. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean to be honest, I mean that surprised me. I never thought uh, Kieran O'Keefe would have, you know, listened to a bit of Mudvayne LD50. That's that's pretty cool. Griff. Yeah. How about your album? No, no, that's too many. Um, oh. the next, well, I mean, because the thing is, is that I've got like, if I had to listen to an album for the rest of my life, and I've had about four minutes to think of the album, and I've thought about 12 albums. <laughs> um, I love music uh, anyway. I just uh, sing along to oh, songs that I love. I'm, you've just got my mind all in a kerfuffle. Um, It's, it's just difficult. Just, just pull one. It, 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 it's never going to happen. This is important to me. <laughs> There's 350 people watching, and they're going to all think that this album's the album I'm going to listen to forever because I told them it was, and that's the point. So I've got to think. It's just a, it's a bit of a process. It's a bit of a process. So it's not the Frozen soundtrack then. I mean, I do like to listen to that with my daughter, but um, and we sing all the songs together and dance. We did it for my uh, niece, me, my sister, um, could sing, and we both sang for my niece, who's um, two years old, and she was like, oh. she thought she was at some concert, and it oh, was just, it was just brilliant. great. Like, but yeah, that that's a secret about me that most people don't know. Anyway. Um, so I'd have to go with City and Colour. Um, which album? I just oh, fuck it. Taking back Sunday new again. That's, there you go. Taking back Sunday. Um, or Lamb of God, the one gun or something. It, it's got. There's just the mud vein. You know. I don't know. There's, it is hard. It is hard. Just loads. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll end it on that one. And the last question. <laughs> the last question. And and the ultimate one. Uh, in the wrap up questions for us all. Uh, if heaven exists. What would you expect God to say uh, say to you at the pearly gates? Oh, God. <laughs> well, for me, it would be quite easy. I would expect God to say, well, now you know. Yep. Anna? I gave you patience. What happened? <laughs> because I had a dream once. I met Jesus and he gave me the gift of patience. And if anyone knows me, he knows I'm not, I'm, I'm not patient at all. No, patient person ever. Yeah. In a lovely way. Give me a lovely box of patience. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, and there, and there we go. I mean, to be honest, I can't think of anything. So, I mean, the questions were for you. We don't mean yeah. Griff. Don't need to chime in onto this one. And that is it, guys. We, we've. Do you know. Go on. Oh, can I just say one thing? Do you know? Because obviously you're Roman Catholic, you're the same as me. Do you think? Um, like as in religion, I mean, I'm a lapsed Roman Catholic, obviously, because um, I don't go to church all the while. My nan forced me to go, you know. Um, do you think that plays a, an effect on the way that you see spirits and stuff like that, and you atone it to your religion yourself, as in, like, I'm a Roman Catholic, so I seen this, and this could be a part of this, blah blah blah. You, you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think the the biggest influence. So, like yourself, I'm a lapsed. Irish Roman yeah. cat well, Irish Roman Catholic, and again, I was forced to go by my nan mostly. Yeah, yeah. But yes, I think light and dark. I think that's the biggest part of Roman Catholicism, kind of recognizing the light and the dark, and the fight between the light and the dark, and whether that's in kind of biblical references or any other references, for example, the exorcism ritual, you name it. There's that constant fight, and I think there's an aspect of that that I've carried over in terms of some of, I feel myself slipping into that sometimes. Yeah. People ask me about, you know, phenomena that happens in a particular case and I'll be thinking, well, that's negative and that's positive. Mm. That's like, you know, that's light, that's dark. Yeah. And I find myself doing that. And I think that's dangerous to distinguish it that way because it's all phenomena and yeah. you're just interpreting it. But I think that's a little bit of a, an influence that carries over from my yeah. Catholic upbringing. So what we what we're going to do right now, because um, it is the end of it. Um, what we're going to do very quickly, we are going to give away the free merch that we said 
uh, right at the very start. We're just going to do the quick spin the wheel right now, and then we're all going to say goodbye. Um, so, yeah, we're just going to get straight into it. Uh, just a bit of it. So here we go. Um, we've got all the names. So thank you to everyone who has entered this uh, competition. We've got quite a lot of names, 120 people who put their name down to win the shirt. Congrat um, um, best of luck to everyone. And, yeah, whoever wins, get in contact with us, leave us a message, comment, whatever. Hopefully, you're still in the chat and you've stuck around. So, here we go, guys. Last thing of the night. Good luck to everyone. Um, and if you did... I offer win, I offer win, I offer win. And if you didn't enter the competition, then where the hell were you, you know? We told you what time to be here. So, next time, make sure you're here at 9pm. And we might give away <laughs> free merch next time. So, anyway, here we go, guys. We're going to spin this thing. And then we're going to love you and leave you. Here we go. Best of luck to everyone. Come on, let's win. I hope one of us wins. If it's Kieran. Uh, if it's Kieran, I'll love it. And it's going to be the best ever. Who is it? Who is it? And there we go. Our winner, Shelly Summer. So if you're still in here, Shelly, congratulations. You've won Give it. Give us if a you... wave, Shelly. Give us a wave. See if she's in. Let's see if she's in. Shelly Summers. Shelly Summer? Shelly Summer. She could have left. She's probably left. But never mind. Um, and there you go. Well done, Shelley. Uh, we'll get in contact with you or you get in contact with us, whoever, whichever's easiest. And, um, yeah, how should we wrap this up? You, you want to advertise anything that's coming up anytime soon, Kieran and Anna? Um, well, for, for us... Oh, yeah. Clubhouse, you? oh yeah, Clubhouse? yeah. If, you're, if you're on Clubhouse, kind of a new thing, get onto Clubhouse and look. type in Paranormal Chat. So I do Clubhouse, which is just an audio, basically, it's just a chat, simply as that. So check that out. Um, look out for a book that's coming out around Halloween time, which is about next generation um, of haunting studies, which I'm releasing with a, an international team. So look out for that. And look out for the ninth episode of the Battersea Poltergeist. The ninth! There's a, there's, there's, to be continued. There was continued. only ever going to be eight. There was only ever going to be eight, but there's been such an interest from the audience and such amazing kind of evidence and theories put forward and some new angles and perspectives on it that um, there will be a ninth episode in a few weeks' time. So oh, man, that's amazing. Announcements about it that. Is, it is, it's good. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Um, Shelley Summer is still in the chat. Shelley oh, my God. Summer. Thank you. So if you can, Shelley, just message us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whichever is easiest for you, and we will sort it all out. And Shelly get you. Summer was so excited. She yeah, woke up. There you go. Um, you're gonna, we're going to send out one of these brand new Ouija Brothers t shirts. So, yeah, get ready for that. And, um, yeah, I, I don't think we've got anything to plug, do we, Jay? So, I think we've plugged it all. Um, t shirts, if you want to follow us independently, you can go on Instagram and type Griff underscore the Ouija Brothers. Same as you can type Steve underscore the Ouija Brothers. You can find Kieran O'Keefe. Anna okay on everything on social if you want to go follow them. Uh, same as us. So just do whatever you do whatever you want. We ain't bothered. If you want to do it, you do can you do want. it. You know, do whatever do you, what you want. want. I mean, except harass us because, I mean, that's not fun at all. Um, but, yeah, thanks for joining us, guys, and it's been a pleasure. And uh, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed great. this episode of whatever we do because I don't even know it is what we do um, <laughs> on these lives. Uh, when we investigate, we might... It's a different story, I hate to stay, but yeah. yeah, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it. No, thank you. Thank it's you. been absolutely brilliant, and we can't wait to investigate with you. That's, that's the next. That's the next stage, definitely. But I mean, what some people might not know, and this is another little fact, is us and Kieran have done something together a while ago, yeah. um, and it was at uh, Thirty East Drive, but that never got published. No. Um, anyway, it never got published anyway, and we we had a good night. Um, it was brilliant. Though. That was with Justin and Dale, wasn't it? Yeah, Justin and Dale from Paranormal Truth. Um, and yeah, that was that was a brilliant night, and Amazing. I can't wait to do it again. And it'll, it'll be it'll just be fun next time we do it. So yep. brilliant. Look so yeah, to it. yeah, man, we're gonna love you, leave you, and we will see you whenever we see you. You know, whenever we decide to show our faces again. You know, a bit yeah. of a, a bit of mystique. You know, you you never know when a video could drop or when a live's coming. You know, always keep you on the toes. So, yeah, um, thank you so much for all the donations. Thank you, everyone, for um, tuning in, watching. Thank you to all the new subscribers. 
um, family members. Just thank you to everyone for everything. Um, greatly and what I was appreciated. Say before we shoot off, is is um, Kieran, you do a lot of um, live streams on your. Is he, is, are those Facebook. personal live streams or are those are those for everybody that they can see? Because I know you've got two different pages. We've got yeah. Generally, we try and we try and do the Facebook streams just for everybody, and it's just random. You know, on the, on any given night, we might kind of say that we're going to be going on live, and we'll just yeah. go onto Facebook. But they will be for everybody. So you can you can check out Dr. Kieran O'Keefe Facebook page, and that's probably the best one. Make sure that you you. Kind of get notice about the streams and it's just basically going on and yeah just randomly talking about the paranormal and answering which everybody that. loves to hear you talk about because i know i've enjoyed it today so yeah carry on then today sorry for but yeah that's it so, so, yeah um so thank you everyone thank you kieran and anna and yeah we will see you again very very soon so take it easy and good night thanks good night thank you bye-bye <laughs>